everyone can hear me? Yes. Right. So we, we're proceeding with uh, session number one. Um, and, and further to what we've already seen on behalf of the President of the Republic of Malawi uh, and the people, I would like to welcome all of you distinguished excellencies and colleagues uh, to this first session. I welcome you all um, to the review meeting on lessons learned uh, and building back better in preparation for the fifth UN conference on the LDCs. And as chair of this meeting, I'd like to share some information with you all to help this meeting run smoothly, as, as smooth as possible in this, in this virtual format and within the allotted time. And therefore, some housekeeping issues, number one, if you're, if you're speaking during the session, uh, please keep your video on, but uh, your microphone on mute when you're not speaking. Second, if you're not speaking at all, uh, please keep your microphones uh, as well as your videos off. Uh, if you're a speaker and in order to ensure everyone has a chance to speak, uh, please keep to the time allotted and wrap up uh, when I do ask you to do so. And for this, we'd like to sincerely thank you for your cooperation. And then finally, to say that the list of registered speakers is being posted in the chat. And uh, the Secretariat will let us know if uh, there is any change. Uh, further, to say that we we'll welcome any additional requests from heads of delegation of the African LDCs and development partners. But uh, we are mindful of the time limits that we have today. Uh, we still welcome any active engagement of all delegations throughout the sessions for the rest of the week. So once again, I would like to sincerely thank you uh, for your kind cooperation, as well as welcome you to this session. I'm informed that uh, Ms. Vera Songwe is uh, running late, and therefore to proceed with the business for the day, I have the honor to give the floor to Dr. Tedros Iberiasus, Director General of the World Health Organization, to deliver a keynote address. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Actually, Ms. Vera Songwa is not running late, she's here. Ms. Vera Songwe, Executive Secretary, Economic Commission for Africa, to give us some remarks, and then I'll come back to Dr. Tedros thereafter. Most welcome. No, 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 I'll, I'll hand the floor to my brother because he can set the scene for us very well. But just to clarify that I was here. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Tedros. Okay, my bad. I was given uh, a change of program, but uh, Dr. Tedros, uh, please uh, proceed. Thank you. I would actually be happy if my sister could speak before me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> okay, okay. I will do that. Um, good to see you. And, good to uh, see you too. <laughs> Excellencies. Um, the Honorable Chair, Dr. Saulus Klaus Chilima, Vice President of the Republic of Malawi, Minister of Economic Planning and Development, uh, Dr. Tedros, uh, the Director General of the, the World Health Organization, uh, my sister, uh, Ms. Fekita, the Under Secretary General and High Representative for LDCs, LLDCs and SIDS, and Secretary General of the LDC5 Conference, Excellencies, um, distinguished UN, uh, uh, distinguished ministers, my UN colleagues, heads of agencies. Uh, I think we also have representatives from our development partners in Haiti. Of course, civil society representatives, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be. It's a pleasure to talk to you today. And I think one of the reasons maybe why uh, Dr. Tedros wanted me to go first is to talk a little bit about the economic 
environment in which we are today as we address the COVID crisis, but also uh, the LDC, uh, uh, I, I, I think challenges that uh, the LDCs face on the continent. Um, just to start, as we all know, uh, Africa is facing its first recession in 25 years in a quarter of a century. Overall, uh, we were doing better before the COVID crisis, but the COVID crisis came alongside an economic crisis and of course a climate crisis that we are all aware of. Uh, that has uh, taken our growth down substantially. Um, growth is now at negative levels, a negative minus 2.4 for all of Africa, but it has hit the LDCs even more. And so LDC growth is going to, is expected to go to about negative 3.4%. This means we're gonna do, we're gonna have to do a lot more, a lot faster to be able uh, um, to recover our growth, let alone grow faster. What does this mean when we look at the growth rates? I think it's, uh, for us economists, we like to show these lines and you see them plummeting, but essentially it means that people are out of jobs. It means that women and youth cannot find jobs, cannot trade, as we know, because of the COVID crisis, a lot of the borders, Africa has 72 borders, were closed. And so trading becomes a little bit uh, more difficult. We are estimating at the Economic Commission for Africa that over 30 million more people will fall into poverty. But it's not just a question of falling into poverty. It's also, we did have about 40% of Africa's population which was vulnerable, and especially in the uh, low uh, uh, LDCs. And now we see those vulnerable populations falling faster into poverty. Africa's poverty is characteristic because Africa's poverty is endemic and it's deeper. When Africans fall into poverty, they fall much further down and they stay for much longer in poverty. So uh, as a continent and particularly Africa's LDCs, I think part of our objective over the last 10 years has been to try to see how we can pull people out of the vulnerable groups so they don't fall down. But here we are. What can we do and where are we going? And, and I, I think we need to look at two or three things. A lot of Africa's LDCs have the same characteristics. Many of them are commodity resource economists. They have also not done well enough uh, with the commodity crisis. So that also has spelled uh, a blow for Africa's LDCs. We do have the largest share of LDCs on the continent, of course, 29, 79% uh, 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 of Africa's LDCs are, are, are commodity dependent, which means that as we have an economic crisis and we have a commodity shock, it hits our LDCs even more. Uh, even though some of our LDCs are trying to diversify, they're not doing it as fast as we can. 60% of Africa's LDCs, as we talk about diversification, as we talk about the CFTA and trade, do not have access to electricity. So again, the LDCs are in a much more difficult category uh, and we know that when we talk about electricity, we're also talking about health, because if you don't have electricity, you don't have access to health centers, you don't have access to the information that you need uh, to ensure that you can take care of yourself during this COVID crisis. Per capita health expenditure in many of our LDCs is below the average level for most of the uh, countries on the continent. We need to continue to grow. Actually, uh, Africa's LDCs have the lowest per capita health expenditure if you take out Liberia. Liberia, thanks to the Ebola crisis, tripled its health expenditure and we must congratulate Liberia and probably learn a lot more from what Liberia has done uh, since Ebola and continues to do even uh, by way of its health workers. Ethiopia, I think, is also doing a good job in terms of health workers and mobilizing health workers to ensure that they can respond to the crisis. There are lessons from our LDCs clearly that we can uh, uh, build on, but they are still falling behind on average in most of the things that we look at. Of course, with the COVID crisis, 300 million African kids are out of school. Many of those in LDCs, less than 20% of the African LDCs uh, have access to the internet, which means that many of these kids today do no longer have access to education, which will exacerbate the inequality gaps. We need to do more. Africa's LDCs in terms of access to the internet are 50 times lower than where Africa is in general. So much, much further behind in terms of that enabler for even information on healthcare. We know today that many more people are accessing healthcare through the internet because we're trying to do social distancing, but it's not the same for our African LDCs. And so more needs to be done uh, in that field. African LDCs are again, <laughs> Uh, 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 one of our higher debt vulnerability countries, of course, uh, when we look at the countries that we're talking about, Sao Tome, Mozambique, 
uh, Ethiopia, we begin to see uh, huge pressures on our on the African LDCs in terms of external debt vulnerability. Many of them have had access to the debt service suspension initiative, but we all know, and uh, His Excellency the President mentioned that, that the debt service suspension initiative, which put about $5 billion to Africa and about $3.7 billion to Africa's LDCs, is useful but has not been enough. We need to do more and we need to do faster. There is now a G20 framework for debt service, um, a debt service framework where we can talk about how we resolve uh, the debt of African uh, countries or all uh, developing uh, countries. I think that we see, we're beginning to see some of Africa's LDCs, Chad, in particular Zambia, uh, moving towards uh, that process to look at what they do. Uh, with the G20 debt framework. But we are arguing at the Economic Commission for Africa that it's not just debt resolution, it's additional liquidity. Countries need new injections of capital. And so as the developed world has given itself 20% of GDP in terms of additional liquidity to respond to the crisis, the least developing world has only had 2%. So the inequalities that are being sort of fostered by this sort of you know, disadvantageous position that we find uh, uh, particularly Africa's LDCs in is particularly important. And especially now that we're talking about access to the vaccines, if the LDCs do not have access to new foreign exchange, new foreign capital by way of special drawing rights from the IMF to be able to purchase vaccines. Yes, we have the COVAX facility and I speak under the control of Dr. Tedros, 20%, but we need to get to 60%. So we're gonna need a lot more resources to do that. We cannot do that while restructuring our debt. And while we know, of course, as we've seen that we've lost a lot of our revenue. So we do need the international community to come to the help of a lot of the LDCs. So, sorry, sorry you're going to be winding down. Yeah, I'm, I'm done, I'm done. So uh, oh. my, my, the, the, I was on the last slide, if you permit. Um, so as I was saying, we do need the international community to continue to respond and support uh, the LDCs as they try to come back to growth with new ways of getting additional liquidity, particularly by extending the debt service suspension initiative and uh, issuing new special drawing rights for access to vaccines. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And uh, very, very quickly, and therefore, we invite uh, Dr. Zedros to uh, share his uh, thoughts. Thank you, thank you very much. Your Excellency, the Right Honorable Dr. Saulos Klaus Chilima, Vice President of the Republic of Malawi and Minister of Economic Planning and Development and Public Sector Reforms, Excellencies, Ministers, esteemed guests, dear colleagues and friends. It's a privilege to join you today. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed our world in ways we could never have imagined when it started just over a year ago. More than 110 million cases have now been reported to WHO and almost 2.5 million people have lost their lives. The pandemic has severely disrupted health systems, including emergency care, primary health care, routine immunization, and many other essential services. The impacts of the pandemic go far beyond the effects of the virus itself. Millions of livelihoods have been lost, schools have been closed, and the global economy has been thrown into turmoil. The pandemic has held a mirror up to our world. It has shown humanity at its best and worst. It has exposed and exploited the fault lines, inequalities, injustices, and contradictions of our world within and between countries. But there are some signs of hope. Globally, the number of weekly reported cases has now declined for six consecutive weeks, and the number of deaths has also fallen for three straight weeks. Meanwhile, the development and approval of safe and effective vaccines is giving all of us hope that we can bring this pandemic under control. Since April last year, WHO and our partners have been working through the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator 
for the equitable distribution of vaccines as a global public goods. As you know, so far around 200 million doses of vaccine have been administered, most of them in the world's richest countries. I want to assure you that vaccine equity is our highest priority and we will not stop until we get it. At the beginning of the year, I issued a challenge to all countries to work together to ensure that vaccination of health workers and older people is underway in all countries within the first 100 days of the year. There are 47 days left. We have a lot of work left to do, but we're making good progress. Three vaccines have now received WHO emergency use listing, giving the green light for these vaccines to be rolled out through COVAX. And at their meeting on Friday, G7 leaders committed 4.3 billion US dollars to fund the equitable distribution of vaccines, diagnostics, and treatments. WHO's regional offices, under the leadership of Dr. Moeti from the African region and Dr. Al Mandari from the Eastern Mediterranean region, are providing technical assistance for countries to prepare for vaccine rollout. I commend the African Union and also the Africa CDC for its ongoing vaccine readiness work through the African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team. Excellencies, even as we work together to respond to the pandemic, we must also learn the lessons it's teaching us. We have all learned many painful lessons over the past year, but today I would like to focus on just three. First, preparedness. It's clear that despite many warnings about pandemics, when COVID-19 hit, the world was not, was badly prepared. Country and community level preparedness investments were inadequate and the international system was not well coordinated to support these efforts. Even some of the wealthiest and most powerful countries were caught off guard and we're surprised. We must work together to address these weaknesses in the global ability to prepare for, prevent, detect, and respond to pandemics. One idea proposed by the Central African Republic and Benin, representing the Africa Group, is a system in which countries agree to a regular and transparent process of peer review, similar to the system of universal periodic review used by the Human Rights Council. WHO accepts this, and it's a very good idea, and we're calling it the Universal Health and Preparedness Review. Its purpose is, purpose is to build mutual trust and accountability for preparedness by exchanging best practices, identifying new and emerging threats, promoting accountability, and targeting investments more efficiently across the world. Another suggestion proposed by Charles Michel, the president of the European Council, is an international treaty for pandemic preparedness and response, which would give force to the international health regulations. WHO is actively developing both ideas, and I encourage all least developed countries to support and participate in both of these initiatives. The second major lesson is that the pandemic has demonstrated that the health of humans, animals, and the planet that sustains us are intimately linked. Approximately 70% of all emerging and re-emerging pathogens are zoonotic. And we don't know when the next threat, the next disease X will emerge. We can only prevent future pandemics with an integrated one health approach that addresses the impact of human activities that disrupt ecosystems, encroach on habitats, and further drive climate change. These activities include pollution, large-scale deforestation and extraction, the intensification of agriculture and livestock production, the overuse and misuse of antibiotics, and the way we produce, consume, and trade food. That means that protecting and promoting human health cannot be a matter for ministries of health alone. Indeed, many of the reasons people get sick and die 
lie outside the health sector in the food we eat, the water we drink, the air we breathe, and the conditions in which we live and work, and also our lifestyle. Addressing these determinants of health will require policy action in agriculture, commerce, education, energy, planning, trade, transport, and more. It takes a whole of government, whole of society approach. And that leads me, Your Excellency, to the third major lesson, which is that health is not a luxury item or a reward for development. It's the foundation of social, economic, and political stability. When health is at risk, everything is at risk. But when health is protected and promoted, individuals, families, communities, economies, and nations can flourish. Health is central. At the UN General Assembly in September 2019, all UN member states converged to endorse the political declaration on universal health coverage. This is just before the COVID-19 started. Member states embraced a vision for a world in which all people have access to essential health services without facing financial hardship. The pandemic has only underlined why universal health coverage is so important. Building strong health systems for universal health coverage requires investments in primary health care, which is the eyes and ears of every health system and the first line of defense against health emergencies of all kinds, from the personal crisis of a heart attack to an outbreak of a new and deadly virus. We know that many African countries have low levels of coverage of health services and a low number of health workers. By contrast, the region of the Americas has almost 10 times more nurses. Africa has long grappled with migration of health workers. To draw attention to these issues, WHO has declared 2021 the International Year of the Health and Care Worker with the theme of protect, invest together. Another key dimension of strong health systems is a reliable supply of safe, effective, and high quality medicines. To that end, WHO is working with the African Union to establish the African Medicines Agency. And I call on all African countries to ratify the treaty so that AMA, the African Medicines Agency, can enter into force. It's a very important, will be very important institution. Excellencies, the COVID-19 pandemic has struck at a time of rapid transformation for Africa, with aging populations and the double burden of communicable and non-communicable diseases, all of which result in greater demands and greater costs for health systems. But we cannot and must not see health as a cost to be contained. Quite the opposite. Health is an investment to be nurtured, an investment in productive populations and in sustainable and inclusive development. History will not judge us solely by how we ended the COVID-19 pandemic, but what we learned, what we changed, and the future we left our children with improved preparedness, a One Health approach, and universal health coverage as our goal, we can build a healthier, safer, fairer, and more sustainable Africa that we all want. I thank you. I thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tedros. We will now move into the statements section. There is a small change first before I start. Um, on, on slot number five, we shall swap, uh, we shall have the FAO statement. And uh, the statement from uh, Sierra Leone will come on slot number seven. I just wanted to give a heads up. Distinguished uh, Excellencies and uh, ladies and gentlemen, this moment, this dialogue presents a great opportunity for African LDCs and Haiti to assess progress made in implementing the Istanbul Plan of, Program of Action. Amidst us is the COVID-19 pandemic whose impact has been catastrophic 
in all key sectors of our development. Despite that, we are optimistic that with the resilient recovery plans we have formulated, our economies will, will be built back better and stronger. And of course, deliver the much needed social economic development for our citizens. Let me at this moment share some lessons and experiences from Malawi. Malawi domesticated the Istanbul Program of Action into the national development strategies to ensure that implementation of the strategy is simplified by using national, finance, national financing systems. With this, we have made tremendous progress in agricultural productivity, productive capacity, energy, transport infrastructure, as well as trade and investment. Malawi increased agricultural productivity primarily through the provision of agricultural inputs uh, that we call subsidy. The main setback is the prevalence of climatic shocks, including droughts and floods. For instance, Malawi was hit hard by Cyclone Idai in 2019. To address these shocks, we're investing in climate smart agriculture, among others. In productive capacity, Malawi has focused on value addition interventions on key agricultural crops such as cassava, beans, oil seeds, such as soya, soya beans, as well as pigeon peas, which we plan to start exporting globally. In the energy sector, Malawi is geared to enhance further energy production with emphasis on clean re renewable energy. We also plan to utilize our regional energy resources through connection to the South Africa regional power pool. In addition, we seek to eliminate inefficiencies through reforms in the energy sector. On behalf of the government and the people of Malawi, let me take this opportunity to express our appreciation to the United Nations Office of the Higher Representative for Least Developed Countries, Least Developed Countries, Land Locked developing countries and SDIs in collaboration with the Rocky Mountain Institute for supporting the sustainable energy investment study. This study is guiding us to identify energy projects with an impact on socioeconomic development of our country. Being landlocked country, Malawi is faced with high transport costs, which make it difficult to fairly compete on the global market. With this in mind, the government, in coordination with the neighboring countries, continues to invest in rail and road infrastructure in order to facilitate trade with the rest of the world. In trade and investment, Malawi has made progress in improving trade transit time through the One Border Post Initiative, thereby streamlining border procedures and facilitating trade with our neighboring countries. Excellencies and all ladies and gentlemen, Malawi is hopeful that our future is bright. We are currently developing a socioeconomic recovery plan whose main objective is to bring back the economy to the pre COVID growth plan and perhaps better. We are aware that uh, recovery will not be easy considering the declining impact of COVID 19 in all our key sectors. I therefore wish to encourage all of us not to give up, but to harness the zeal to push until the conditions of our economies are transformed. Undoubtedly, we are the right people to change the course of our nation's destiny. I thank you for your attention and God bless. I will now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Salide Motoborani, who is the Minister of Economic Planning and Development for Lesotho. You have the floor. Your, Your Excellency, President of Malawi, Chair of LDC Group. Your Excellency, Heads of State and Government, Your Excellency, President of General Assembly, Your Excellency, Heads of Delegations, 
honorable ministers, members of civil society, members of private sector, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor and privilege for me to address this African Regional Review Meeting in preparation for the fifth United Nations Conference on LDC, which is envisaged to be held in January 2022. I would like to thank the government of the Republic of Malawi for organizing this important meeting that will eventually uh, grade a pathway towards achievement of not only the LDC agenda, but of the SDGs as well. Program director, I'm hopeful that this meeting will afford us an opportunity to reflect on how far we have come since the Istanbul conference 10 years ago and also to share experiences and work closely together to chart the way forward in ensuring that more countries graduate out of the least developed status. Program director, in the case of my country, Lesotho, I wish to inform, inform you that the government has been making deliberate effort to drive our country towards sustainable economic growth and and as a result, get it out of the, of the LDC status. This is being done through the implementation of the National Strategic Development Plan. Lesotho did not approach implementation of the of Eastern Blue Program of Action by developing an independent graduation strategy, but rather developed NSDP strategic goals in line with our poor objectives. In that regard, graduation is therefore more desirable as one of the impacts of sustainable development rather than an independent aspiration on its own. Aligning itself with the objectives of the poor, Lesotho through the NSDP sets out to pursue economic and institutional transformation for private sector let jobs and inclusive by enhancing inclusive and sustainable economic growth and private sector job creation, strengthening human capital, building enabling infrastructure and strengthening national governance and accountability systems. The country has actively engaged the private sector in formulating and implementing strategies that will drive economic development and, and sustainable job creation. We have redoubled our efforts to improve the investment climate through the investment climate reform process that is aimed at increasing private investment in the economy to promote financial resource mobilization for development. We continue to receive invaluable support from our development partners, including the World Bank, World Trade Organization, and UN agencies, to mention a few. Allow me to highlight performance on the graduation criteria. Lesotho has not achieved any of the criteria. Its gross national income per capita of around 1,296 US dollars is above the graduation threshold of $1,230, US but still much lower than the income-only graduation threshold of $2,460. US the Human Asset Index is 61.6, which is below the graduation threshold of 66 or, up, 66 or above, and the Economic Vulnerability Index is at 42, which is higher than the graduation threshold of 32 or below. Program director, although we did not meet the graduation criteria, significant oh, progress. You should be winding down. You should be winding down in the next one minute. Although we did not meet the graduation criteria, significant progress has been made in Lesotho's effort 
to graduate out of this category. Though we still face challenges that continue to limit our productive and absorptive capacity, growth in our export base, adequate trade and investment flows, as well as eradication of our health care challenges. Literacy rates have been improving over time through the introduction of the th free and compulsory primary education, as well as a high level of secondary enrollment and, and adult education. Furthermore, the government of Lesotho, through the Ministry of Education and Training, has developed a curriculum and assessment policy aimed at harnessing and developing the necessary skills that are better aligned to our economic strategy. In the case of the under five mortality rate, there has been a significant decline from 117 per 1,000 live births to 86.4. One of the major factors that could be attributed to this positive development is the improvement of immunization coverage and child nutrition. We, we will work to ensure that we improve the health outcomes in order to promote a healthy human resource base towards an enhanced productivity and overall economic development. Program director, our economy like the rest of the world is now experiencing negative impacts of COVID-19. The pandemic has created a strain in our country as a result of its immediate uh, policy response requirements, such as border closures, manufacturing plants, shutdowns, schools closure, travel restrictions, to mention a few. To date, Lesotho has imposed two nationwide lockdowns, which have added more pressure to the already frail economy, leading to loss of jobs and lowered economic productivity. It is my sincere belief that we will work together to pursue the LDC agenda in the context of COVID-19, addressing not only the challenges, but also tapping into the opportunities that may have been brought on by the pandemic. Lesotho has already worked on a plan towards building and the recovery of the economy. Government proposes acceleration of the implementation of its national strategic development plan through further, further prior, prioritization of key sectors and actions that will grade jobs and stimulate economic growth. Program Director, it is our fervent hope that the United Nations development and trading partners will continue to support our efforts towards uh, meeting graduation targets with concrete actions and adequate financial resources. It is now more critical than ever to join our hands in order to build productive capacity of the LD LDCs and build resilience of our economies to other shocks and pandemics that we may come across in the future. May I conclude by mentioning that Lesotho's National Vision 2020 implementation ended in the year 2020, and we are in the process of defining the succeeding national vision. This is therefore an opportunity to further streamline our strategies to ensure synergies with new global perspectives, which include sustainable development goals. The African Union Agenda 2063, Financing for Development and LDC Development Agenda. I wish, I wish all of us fruitful deliberations in the coming week as we prepare for a successful fifth United Nations Conference on LDCs. I thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I will swap uh, Norway for uh, Portugal, but uh, let me very quickly say, we have all been given four minutes to make our statements. If we could stick to the four minutes we've been allocated, we'll make much faster progress. So at this stage, uh, I give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Francesco Andre, Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs and Cooperation of Portugal. Muito obrigado. Uh, excelências, uh, senhoras e senhores, 
há 10 anos atrás, há 10 anos atrás, em plena crise financeira internacional, adotámos o programa de ação de Istambul. Hoje, enquanto atravessamos uma nova crise à escala mundial de emergência sanitária, importa reconhecer os progressos alcançados, mas também olhar atentamente para os desafios. A Covid-19 está a afetar todos os países. No entanto, como é globalmente reconhecido, terá impactos mais profundos e por muito mais tempo nos países mais vulneráveis. Enfrentamos hoje um risco real de não apenas ficarmos aquém das metas traçadas, como de ver agravadas as desigualdades existentes. Se há algum aspecto positivo a retirar da atual crise pandémica, é a certeza de que o mundo é interdependente e de que o desenvolvimento de uns é o desenvolvimento de todos, como aliás afirmado na Agenda 2030. Esta noção de interdependência, agora confirmada de forma tão clara, tem de constituir um ponto de inflexão para uma mudança real. E isto é mais do que um imperativo moral. Uma resposta adequada e global aos desafios colocados pela Covid-19 deve promover uma recuperação inclusiva e sustentável. A única forma de gerir os desafios que coletivamente nos confrontamos e, repito, que temos necessariamente de enfrentar em conjunto. Devemos empenhar-nos, por isso, de forma efetivamente consequente em unir esforços para Build Back Better Together. Os parceiros do desenvolvimento devem reforçar, agora mais do que nunca, o apoio aos países menos avançados, desde logo em África, de forma a que se possam, a que se possam ser ultrapassadas, com determinação, as dificuldades encontradas nos últimos 10 anos, contribuindo assim para a solução dos problemas estruturais que obstam à redução da pobreza e ao desenvolvimento económico. Excelências, Portugal está bem ciente da importância de apoiar os países mais vulneráveis. Temos sido defensores ativos de uma particular atenção aos países menos avançados por parte da comunidade internacional. Nesse âmbito, importará sublinhar que 60% da ajuda pública ao desenvolvimento bilateral portuguesa está concentrada nos países menos avançados e em África. O nosso apoio é concretizado através da disponibilização de recursos financeiros, da, capitação, da capacitação institucional, da formação de profissionais, sobretudo nas áreas da saúde e da educação, e ainda do apoio às micro, pequenas e médias empresas, entre outros setores e medidas. O atual contexto de pandemia redobra a nossa responsabilidade. Iremos, esforçar, iremos nos esforçar por fazer mais e melhor, de forma mais eficiente, coerente e coordenada. Esperamos testemunhar um aumento significativo no número de países que graduam da categoria de países menos avançados, sem, no entanto, esquecer que esta é apenas uma etapa de um processo de desenvolvimento que deverá continuar a ser apoiado para ser sustentável e não permitir retrocessos. Por último, e antes de terminar, uma palavra sobre a dimensão europeia. A União Europeia é hoje o maior parceiro comercial e desenvolvimento dos países menos avançados. Falamos de cerca de 19 mil milhões de euros em ajuda pública para o desenvolvimento para este grupo de países só no ano de 2019. E, portanto, neste contexto de Covid-19, os Estados-membros da União Europeia, a Comissão e as instituições financeiras europeias juntaram forças para mobilizar um pacote de apoio significativo para os países parceiros. Portugal assumiu em janeiro passado a presidência do Conselho da União Europeia. E na área das parcerias internacionais, elegemos como temática prioritária o desenvolvimento humano, condição sine qua non do desenvolvimento sustentável. Levamos para este quadro aquela que é uma prioridade de longa data da política externa de Portugal, a relação de parceria e proximidade histórica com o continente africano. Por essas e outras razões, daremos particular atenção à recuperação da atual crise. Em abril, organizaremos em parceria com o Banco Europeu de Investimento, o Fórum Económico de Investimento Verde de Alto Nível, União Europeia-África, para o reforço do investimento entre os dois continentes, com particular ênfase na economia verde e na transição energética. Queremos fomentar uma parceria efetiva para o desenvolvimento económico e a criação de emprego em África. Em forma de conclusão, deixem-me garantir-vos que a disponibilidade de Portugal para, ao longo dos próximos meses, contribuir ativamente para a preparação da 5 Conferência das Nações Unidas para os Países Menos Avançados. Muito obrigado. Obrigado. Thank you so much, uh, Excellency Vice President of the Republic of Malawi, Excellencies, Ministers, colleagues of the UN family, ladies and gentlemen. 
Dr. Chilima, I begin by joining others in thanking you for hosting this Africa Regional Review Meeting. And my only regret is that we cannot be with you in Lilongwe, a city um, that I have often had the opportunity to spend time in. And I hope it will be not too long before we can also have the opportunity to return. You have given us four minutes for a meeting that is happening in the midst of a deep crisis. And my colleagues, Vera, Dr. Tedros, and others have already spoken to the long shadow that COVID-19 will cast over the preparatory process for LDC-5. And I think my colleague Fekita and I, who joined the President of the General Assembly last week at an advisory board meeting, certainly recognize that it will be a challenging period in which to try and frame, uh, first of all, a response in terms of the agenda of LDCs vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, and secondly, for the international community to also find an appropriate way of responding so what is a crisis that is really just beginning to move into the next phase? We know that COVID-19 will have, as Vera showed, devastating economic consequences, health systems, our citizens will continue to suffer in terms of losing loved ones, losing fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, children. It is not an easy period in which to think forward boldly. And yet, I think it is quite clear that despite this reversal and despite the focus on crisis management and despite the challenge of fiscal uh, space, of constraints, of the looming debt crisis, we need to also think about how we can invest in that future pathway out of this crisis. And in that sense, the LDC-5 conference takes on a very significant role in focusing attention on a group of countries and particularly in our session today on the African continent that need to be at the forefront of our commitment of the 2030 agenda, leave no one behind. As you all know, UNDP and the UN development system have been at the forefront of working with countries, LDCs and most, if not all countries across the African continent on a socioeconomic assessment, on a health crisis response and also on recovery strategies. And while it may seem premature to talk about recovery, it is precisely in the combination of crisis management and recovery investments that the best hope lies for coming out of this crisis sooner rather than later. Four areas have emerged from our experience and since our session today is about lessons learned that are central to investments right now in the midst of still dealing with the challenge of vaccinations, the challenge of stabilizing economies. The four areas, and I do not have time to go into them, but they are available in more detail also on our website, that have emerged are in the domain of governance. We see countries with functional effective governance systems that um, deal with both central government and local government effectiveness and efficiency in coping with the countries in a more resilient fashion, with, with the COVID crisis in a more resilient fashion and manner. We need to invest quickly in the ability of these governance systems to, strength, to be strengthened and to allow governments to develop national response strategies, whether it is in the health system, in the rule of law, in the way that um, local governments can function. Secondly, social protection. It is a self-evident statement, but yet what COVID-19 has shown us in such a brutal manner is that there are still so many who fall really through the cracks. There is no social protection system except the immediate family, the community. And when you face a devastating situation like COVID-19, we must look carefully and quickly at how public protection, social protection systems can be strengthened. We have heard about the green recovery and certainly it is an opportunity and Vice President, you already spoke to it in terms of Malawi's own strategy. There is an enormous opportunity here to recover, recover better, to invest and investment is a way out of this crisis. And certainly we remain very focused as UNDP in assisting countries, both in the urban and the rural economy to look at these opportunities. And fourthly, digitalization, a key area that if not invested in and understood in terms of its significance for the future of development of LDCs and African countries will certainly um, amplify inequalities further. Let me end by saying that you know UNDP and most of your countries, we remain deeply committed to LDCs, to their priorities, to bringing their needs, but also their ability to act to the international community's attention, to invest on the continent with our accelerator labs, with the Africa Borderlands Center, and also to try and address the issue that a number of you have spoken to. Graduation of LDCs needs to become a more sophisticated, a broader understood instrument. This is why we have contributed also together with DESA and our colleague uh, USG Fekita to the discussion about 
a multidimensional vulnerability index. We need to find a smarter way to deal with graduation and simply taking per capita GDP in order to define the pathway forward in development. These are some of the key issues that I think will both in the short term, in the midst of COVID-19, but also in the lead up to LDC5 and beyond define the parameters of an investment strategy and commitment to LDCs. Thank you so much, Vice President. It's an honor and a pleasure to join you today. Thank you very much, and uh, most welcome when uh, the situation improves. Um, because of the swap, I will now invite uh, the FAO Director General, Mr. Q Dong, Dong Yu, to address us. Okay, thank you, Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Africa is not on track to achieve the sustainable development goal of zero hunger by 2030. And the challenges are more permanent for the regional the developed countries. The latest report on the state of food security and nutrition in the world produced by FAO with other UN partners painted a stark picture of the food security situation in Africa least the developing countries. In 2019, even before the pandemic, and uh, there is a 235 million hunger people in sub-Saharan Africa. The prevalence of undernourishment is the highest in Africa, more than twice in the global average. This trend are more worrisome of the least developing countries with the prevalence of undernourishment of 23%, which is four points higher than the Africa average. Furthermore, more least developing countries are located in Africa, 33 out of 46. COVID-19 is threatening food security, nutrition, and economies in sub-Saharan Africa in an unprecedented way, as uh, my colleagues already mentioned several times. Pandemic measures to control the uh, spread of the disease disrupt the food system and the trigger the social economic impact. No doubt, the pandemic has become a significant threat to end extreme poverty and eradicate hunger in Africa. The risk of Swapping out of the modest gain made towards achieving the sustainable goals of the Mal Malabo degradation and the Agenda 2063. We needed to take bold age action to protect and enhance the resilience of most vulnerable populations, particularly those in least developing countries. It's imperative to ensure the function of domestic agricultural food value chain and to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on agricultural food system and the livelihood of rural area poor. Without such action, we risk that the current public health crisis become a food and economic crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, food and agriculture hold the key to re realize the 2030 agenda as agriculture is the most inclusive and efficient tool to end poverty and hunger. We seek to attain this goal by working for better production, better nutrition, better environment, and better life for all, the four betters. FAO is well positioned as a professional UN organization, knowledge hub, and a facilitator to assist all countries to realize the goals of the 2030 agenda, in particular ending poverty, hunger, and malnutrition, and promoting sustainable agriculture. We established the office of small island, small island developed state, least developed countries, and the landlocked developed countries to ensure that the special needs of these vulnerable populations are met. This dedicated office Coordinated existing resources cutting across all the technical departments of decentralized networks to ensure the comprehensive attention and the coherent approach towards SIDS, LDSs, and LLDCs. We launched the Hand in Hand Initiative to accelerate agricultural transformation and sustainable rural development to end the poverty, hunger, and all forms of malnutrition. The evidence-based country-lead, country-owned initiative also contributed to the attainment of all the other sustainable development goals. The initiative built on state-of-the-art tools include hand-in-hand -hand geospatial platform and the data lab for statistical innovation and big data tools like SMAP. FAO strongly believes that the potential of science, its power, must be harnessed to promote agro-food system transformation. I, I'm delighted to hear the Honorable uh, President mention that uh, we, Malawi also you need to transform your agricultural food system to feed the demand of the consumers and farmers and the social economic development. We established the Office of Innovation 
to facilitate the adoption of innovative approach and the use of modern science and technology, including digital solutions. This office will further consolidate and strengthen FL innovative spirit, including the innovation of the mindset, innovation of cooperation models, and innovation application by digitalization. Concrete consolidated efforts are needed to enable LDCs to reap the full benefit of modern technology and digital applications. FAO, in cooperation with the other partners at the country, regional, global levels, acted swiftly to help the countries take decisive action in response to COVID-19. With this holistic global program, FAO developed the COVID-19 response or recovery program for Africa to ensure that the region has a well articulated and a coordinated approach to, for dealing with the challenges. The program identifies seven priority areas of work that are being discussed with the Africa Union Commission, regional economic communities and members to ensure alignment with the regional and the country priority. True transformation record the inclusion of shareholder key actors and the private sectors has an important role to play in this. That's why we introduced a modern strategy for private sec sec sector engagement. It allows to expand the areas of mutually beneficial collaboration, such as technology, innovation, data, investment, and the innovative financing that also tailoring the modalities to specific contexts. Ladies and gentlemen, the challenges are enormous. We must transform agri food system to feed the global population, provide a healthy, affordable diet for everyone. We needed to do so in a way that the economic and profitable, environment friendly. Momentum is building towards the United Nations Food System Summit to catalyze the global effort for inclusive, fast agro food systems. Effectiveness responsible to the uh, response to the COVID-19 pandemic requires a focused attention to this transformation of agro food systems. Build back better through high productivity, diversification, greater resilience, nutrition, smarter innovation, and supporting the vibrant private sector, include small to medium enterprises to create quality jobs in their recovery. Taking an agro-food system approach to build back better requires innovation and enhanced use of the technology digitalization address the complexity of the 2030 agenda. It is to record partnerships, not only government, private, civil society, academic, civil society. So also we need also learn and share experience among us, LDCs. So let's rise into the holistic challenge and to do holistically and coherently. Thank you, over to you. Right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Director General. We'll now proceed with a uh, statement from uh, Sierra Leone. His Excellency Mr. Francis Mustafa Kaikai, Minister of Planning and Economic Development. You have the floor. Hello. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, please proceed. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, the Right Honorable Dr. Chilima, Vice President and Minister of Economic Planning uh, and Public Sector Reforms of Malawi, colleague ministers, excellencies, development partners, civil society organizations, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to address this ministerial dialogue on lessons learned and building better, back better in this Africa Regional Review Meeting in preparation for the fifth United Nations Conference on LDCs and to bring you warmest greetings from His Excellency the President uh, Julius Madabio and the people of Sierra Leone. Let me join colleague ministers and others in thanking the government and people of Malawi for convening this timely meeting with a very rich agenda. We are gratified that His Excellency the President of Malawi gave special opening remarks, showing the inspirational leadership of Malawi in chairing the activities of the LDC group. We extend our profound condolences to all member states for the loss of life during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. As 
the COVID-19 vaccine rolls out, progressive disease will have access to these life-saving vaccines, and that COVID-19 infections will steadily decline to allow for a return to a new normal. We continue to salute our frontline workers globally, including the WHO, who continue to put their lives that will soon be put under control. As noted in the Secretary General's 2020 report on the implementation of the Istanbul Program of Action and that of the Economic Commission for Africa on Africa LDCs, COVID-19 has worsened the structural challenges of LDCs given the fragilities of our systems, and it may well reverse hard and developmental gains we have attained uh, in reaching the international policies and initiatives to address the needs of LDCs, especially in the post-COVID-19 era. Before COVID-19, Sierra Leone was on a good trajectory in its sustainable development drive and had firmly anchored its policies on developing its human capital. Even with COVID-19, human capital development continues to be the flagship program of government with the realization that the future of our country depends on the extent to which its human resources are capable to meet the challenges of being a less developed country, as well as addressing the post-pandemic recovery. The Sierra Leone Medium-Term National Development Plan, from running from 2019 to 2023, with a people-centered focus, is aligned with the Sustainable Development Goals the Istanbul Program of Action Commitments, and the African Union Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. It is our roadmap to meeting nationally and internationally agreed agendas and to growth and stability. We have to into the implementation of this plan and the midterm review revealed a strong local ownership setbacks caused by the pandemic. We believe that the full implementation of our medium-term plan will put us in a good stead to make progress on the SDGs and meeting the requirements of the AU Agenda 2063. We are therefore looking forward to a fruitful outcome that is both ambitious and supportive of the special needs of respective LDCs taking into account their common and differentiated challenges. Mr. Chairman, LDCs in fragile situations with huge debt burdens, weak health systems, and other structural vulnerabilities. And the challenge of meeting the social and economic needs of their populations, especially the youth and the women, require support measures to help sail through the plus group of fragile states that promotes peace and security as a necessary condition for growth and sustainable development. We hope to use the UN observer status accorded to the G7 plus to strengthen our advocacy in favor of building peace and promoting good governance in our countries. In this regard, we'd like to underscore the need for support measures to help address our vulnerabilities and accelerate the realization of the SDGs. Mr. Chairman, distinguished delegates, we acknowledge the support provided by international partners in addressing the increased financial needs of LDCs as a result of the pandemic. However, the external debt stock and debt service of many of our countries has increased significantly during this period. Therefore, we call for an extension of debt moratorium, additional special drawing rights, and ultimate consideration of debt cancellation for LDCs. Furthermore, LDCs need additional resources to cope and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to provide a fiscal space and liquidity through budget support and extended credit amenities to manage the aftermath of the pandemic. As we applaud the support of the development partners in the fight against COVID-19, we in the same vein want to draw the attention of the international community to the need for increased resource flows finance, recovery efforts and the achievement of the SDGs. Whilst there are, such efforts have been hampered, there is therefore a need for our development part in order to finance the SDGs and post-COVID-19 recovery. Mr. Chairman, we believe that our deliberations in the lead up to the LDC 5th conference should also consider the needs of LDCs, especially in the areas of aid for trade, 
financing for development, as well as the need for LDCs to by leveraging the existing mechanisms and addressing the rapidly widening digital gap that threatens to leave LDCs even further behind. In view of this, there should be a renewed commitment to the international community, new renewed commitment of the international community to maximize the benefits of migration resource mobilization as a matter of urgency to attain agreed milestones. LDC Fifth Conference in Doha to take stock of gaps and challenges in the implementation of the Istanbul Program of Action. Map out field on the IQA and create an opportunity to foster sustainable development in LDCs. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, let right. me note that the government of Sierra Leone remains committed to various international initiatives aimed at improving governance systems combating corruption, promoting inclusive development, and delivering services to our people. We look forward to a very successful regional review meeting outcome that will thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Sierra Leone. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, we will skip, um, there's a slight change again. We will have the EU. Mm -hmm. At this stage, I invite the EU Director General uh, for um, International Cooperation to deliver their statement. Well, thank you very much, Right Honorable uh, Dr. Chilima, Vice President of Malawi, Ministers, Excellencies, all protocol observed. It's really a, a great pleasure uh, to attend uh, this important meeting today. I think that from the different interventions we've already heard at this session, one thing is clear for sure. The world um, will not meet the sustainable development goals which we have set ourselves by 2030 unless significant progress can be made to allow also the least developed countries to overcome their vulnerabilities and to transition into sustainable development. Our meeting today also makes clear that the recipe for this is not straightforward. And in that context, I would like to share with you maybe three uh, key messages. First of all, on the importance of seeing poverty not just as an isolated challenge, uh, but to see how it is closely connected with the other big global challenges of our time, with climate change, with digitalization, with inequalities, and with the undermining of democracy. And I think that if our collective efforts to uh, address these trends fail, individual countries' efforts to address the challenge of poverty will face major headwinds. This is compounded by the fact that low-income countries are part of regions where they coexist with wealthier countries, which offers both the chance and the need to connect them to the more positive dynamics in the same regions. Secondly, so how do we help partners address poverty against those very tough headwinds of the future. Even before the, the pandemic, I think the world was on a dangerously unsustainable path. Yet the crisis has exacerbated many of the world's structural imbalances, widening inequalities and hitting hardest those who are less able to cope. And so leading a country through a pandemic of this scale has many similarities to leading it through a war and some heads of state have indeed made that comparison explicitly. It reminds me of the fact that some of the greatest uh, theorists of warfare have said that it could not be fought using military expertise alone, that other perspectives had to be integrated too. And applied to the pandemic, which has such a huge disruptive impact on the economy and the societies of so many countries across the globe, it means that we need an approach that is total in nature requiring a collective full-scale mobilization. Last spring, the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has called at the United Nations for a global recovery initiative that is green, digital, socially just, 
and resilient. And the underlying concept behind it is really sustainability in its various forms. Environmental sustainability, because the recovery is not sustainable if it doesn't take into account the need to stop climate change, which is steadfastly threatening our livelihoods and ultimately our existence. And because also there is a strong business case to it. More than half of global GDP is dependent on high functioning biodiversity and ecosystems. And it, it is from food to tourism. Digital sustainability because the recovery is not sustainable if it does not fully embed the process of digitalization uh, that is so much um, at the key of our work and our living environment. And the pandemic has only accelerated it. And still the digital divide and within it, the gender divide is huge. And if not addressed, all of this will deepen inequalities. So we need a holistic digital rule book that builds infrastructure for greater accessibility, that invests in innovation and skills, that protects data and privacy, and that is ultimately human-centric and value-based. Socioeconomic sustainability as well, because the recovery is not sustainable if it doesn't generate benefits for all parts of society in an inclusive way, and if it doesn't accompany the demographic boom, and particularly in Africa, and the need for the domestic job markets that meet the young population's demands for decent jobs. And finally, governance, because the recovery is not sustainable if our democratic institutions and mechanisms are challenged by populism and misinformation. It brings me to my third point. What is the European Union doing to deliver as a partner on the global recovery. I would make two points here. We are acting by generating scale and by mobilizing the right flexible tools. We generate scale through Team Europe, which brings together the expertise, the network, and the resources of the whole EU family, the European institutions, our European member states, the European development finance institutions, and so on, to provide a coordinated, efficient and impactful response to the challenges we face. And in less than one year, Team Europe has mobilized nearly 40 billion euros to help partners respond to the health and social economic crisis. It has led contributions to COVAX with over 2.2 billion euros contributed. And it has invested in structural partnership, for instance, to the work of the European Center for Disease Control and the African Center for Disease Control, and by starting to explore how we can best support African partner countries that have the capacity to build and to build local manufacturing and production capacity for vaccines. So that's the scale part. Now we're also uh, mobilizing flexible instruments through a more focused and foreign aid budget that will lead under the new financial perspectives to a substantial financial increase which is not only one in quantity, but also in quality, so that we can really match the, the, the needs of our partner countries' structural needs. And crucially, it will make use of innovative mechanisms that al allow us to leverage the power and the contribution of other actors by designing policy packages bespoke to the specific situation of our partner countries, combining our tools to help when that, that restructuring happens, to provide concessional financing and to offer technical assistance as well as private sector development. Europe and Africa are preparing to hold their next EU-AU summit as soon as the COVID-19 circumstances allow for it. And it is through such common understanding of the global challenges we face that the collective effort to address them through sustainable policy initiatives hopefully will deliver improvement on the ground for the least developed countries of the globe. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the new uh, Director General. I'll move on to give the floor now to His Excellency Mr. Mamadi Kamara, who is the Minister of, Minister of Economy and Finance for uh, Guinea. You have the floor. The Minister from Guinea is not ready. Merci. 
Mesdames et Messieurs, en vos grades et qualités, tout protocole confondu. Je voudrais pour commencer exprimer au nom du ministre de l'Économie et des Finances empêchées ma profonde gratitude aux organisateurs de cette importante réunion régionale d'examen pour l'Afrique et l'Haïti. Aux membres de cette réunion qui apportent une précieuse contribution à la consolidation de notre région, je voudrais leur adresser mes salutations les plus chaleureuses. Mesdames et Messieurs, la Guinée, mon pays, à l'instar des autres pays du monde, a été frappé de plein frais par la pandémie du COVID-19 en 2020. Cela s'est traduit par des pertes de vies humaines et des conséquences économiques imprévisibles. En effet, le nombre de personnes contaminées est passé de 3 en mars à 5620 pour se situer à 15 154 cas à la date du 18 février 2021. Quant au décès, il, le nombre de décès est passé de 34 en juillet 2020 à 85 en février 2021. Malgré les mesures prises par le gouvernement, le pays continue à enregistrer une augmentation de cas de contamination et de décès. En termes de conséquences économiques, les principaux partenaires de la Guinée sont durement affectés par la maladie à coronavirus, notamment la Chine et l'Union européenne. L'ampleur de la pandémie dans ces deux zones économiques expose la Guinée à des chocs exogènes majeurs. L'effet conjugué de ces chocs exogènes, des stabilisateurs et des mesures d'urgence sanitaire instaurées par le gouvernement pourraient se traduire par un ralentissement de l'activité économique dans certains secteurs, une dégradation des conditions de vie de la population vulnérable. Dans le but de mieux évaluer l'impact de la pandémie sur l'économie guinéenne, une étude a été initiée par mon département. Les principaux enseignements tirés de cette étude montrent que 55,7% des ménages n'ont pas pu se rendre à leur lieu de travail au cours de la période de l'enquête. Cette situation a beaucoup plus impacté les ménages dirigés par les femmes, 65,7%, que ceux dirigés par les hommes, 54%. Les principales raisons évoquées par rapport à l'absence au travail sont entre l'arrêt d'activité, c'est 45,4%, la réduction du personnel, 20,5%, la maladie autre que le COVID-19, 24,8%. Les transferts de fonds constituent une source d'appoint de revenus pour 23% des ménages et 89% des bénéfices ont été rencontrés, ont rencontré du moins des difficultés dans la réception de La baisse de revenus a continué à la contribué à la dégradation des conditions de vie des ménages.
ainsi, 41,5% des ménages ont été contraints de changer le régime, de régime alimentaire, alors que 44,4% ont carrément été en repas. En outre, 55% des ménages ont mangé moins qu'ils n'auraient connu et même 29,3% des ménages ont été confrontés à un manque de nourriture. À l'ensemble, plus du tiers des ménages ont connu la faim par manque de ressources. L'accès aux services de santé, d'éducation et d'assainissement a, a été également affecté par les conséquences de la pandémie. La majorité des entreprises formelles, 80% ont été négativement impactées par la crise du COVID-19, à travers notamment la baisse du chiffre d'affaires qui résulterait d'une And anyone uh, still here? The presentation from Guinea. Have we lost the Guinea presentation or are they still online? And percent declare our account stater une baisse de leur chiffre d'affaires depuis l'apparition de la pandémie entraînant des difficultés de trésorerie dans la majorité des cas. Pour contrecarrer les retombées négatives de la propagation de la COVID-19, le gouvernement sous l'égide du premier ministre et sur la haute instruction du président de la République a mis en place un plan de riposte au COVID-19 et de stabilisation économique consolidé par l'élaboration de la stratégie nationale de lutte contre COVID-19 sur la période 2020-2022. En matière de finances publiques, nos actions ont été orientées vers le relèvement de quatre défis. Un, estimé et trouver des ressources budgétaires et financières supplémentaires. Deux, assurer la disponibilité des fonds pour les unités de prestation de services et les décaissements effi efficacement en tenant durement compte des contrôles. Trois, suivre et comptabiliser les ressources déployées dans le cadre des interventions d'urgence et en rendre compte de manière transparente. Et enfin, assurer la continuité des activités avec le personnel essentiel des différentes structures. Les réactivités du, des pouvoirs publics par le relèvement de ces défis, qualifiés d'exemplaires par les observateurs, a permis d'atténuer les impacts néfastes de la pandémie sur l'économie nationale. Ainsi, en 2020, la croissance est ressortie à 5,2% contre une prévision de 1,3% en avril 2020. Cette résilience de l'économie provient de la bonne orientation de la production de bauxite et d'or, ce qui a permis une forte amélioration du compte courant qui est assorti d'excédentaire de 32,6% du PIB. Toutefois, on note une légère accentuation des pressions inflationnistes avec un taux d'inflation en moyenne de 10,7% en raison, entre autres, de la perturbation des circuits d'approvisionnement. 
En ce qui concerne les perspectives à moyen terme, nos efforts seront orientés vers la consolidation des acquis et la poursuite de la mise en œuvre des réformes relatives à la transparence budgétaire, la rationalisation des dépenses publiques de fonctionnement, l'amélioration et l'efficacité de l'efficacité et de l'efficience des investissements publics, le renforcement de l'intervention publique dans le secteur porteur de croissance et l'application effective des dispositions contenues dans le nouveau cadre législatif et réglementaire des finances publiques. Ces mesures devraient renforcer la résilience économique de la Guinée afin de nous permettre hein, d'atteindre et maintenir un taux de croissance économique supérieur à 5 de, de réaliser un taux d'inflation inférieur ou égal à 5 et un déficit budgétaire de moins de 3 du PIB, conformément au seuil fixé dans le cadre du programme de coopération monétaire de la CDAO. Et enfin, de maintenir la viabilité au compte courant de la balance de paiement. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. Um, we shall now proceed uh, to listen to the Norwegian uh, presentation by His Excellency Mr. Doug Houston, Minister of International Development. And this is a pre-recorded video. Can the Secretariat please play that for us? Dear friends and partners in development, once again we are being deprived of the opportunity to share each other's views and assessments in real life. But if we make the most of the opportunities we can grasp, we will soon be able to meet again too. While Malawi and others are seeing their second wave of COVID fading, others are going through the worst parts of this pandemic. What we all have in common, like Dr. Tedros of the WHO has described it, is that the fire is far from out. If we stop fighting it, on any front, it will come roaring back. And we must fight it together, because it is right and because it is the only way the fire will ever stop, be it in Guinea or Germany. We must fight the virus and we must fight all the problems we were fighting before the pandemic struck. We must fight hunger, drought, illiteracy and ignorance. We must stand up against war and modern slavery and we must combat climate change. We must combat the consequences of climate change. We must fight Ebola, which once again has erupted in Guinea and the Democratic Republic of Congo. We must do what we can together to eradicate extreme poverty and reach the other sustainable development goals. The pandemic has um, rendered the achievements of all these goals more difficult. But once again, if we grasp all the opportunities we can grasp, our goals will be within grasp too. Right now, there can be no higher priority than access to vaccines vaccines for all. And that is why Norway is co-chairing the Facilitation Council of the ACT Accelerator together with South Africa in order to mobilize support to develop, produce and make COVID-19 vaccines, treatment and test available globally. It is urgent that the scientific progress made in development of new vaccines is followed by efforts to promote equitable access reaching people and health systems all over the world. The vaccine pillar COVAX has agreements in place to access 2 billion doses of several promising vaccine candidates. Within the next few weeks, we expect the first COVAX vaccine doses to be unloaded from the plane at the airport and then administrated to high-risk populations and healthcare workers, including in low-income countries. 
Ensuring rapid and equitable rollout of vaccines globally is essential for saving lives and livelihoods alike. For saving health systems and jobs, for stabilizing economies. All countries must step up to finance that $27 billion missing to fund the ACT Accelerator. This makes up only 0.25% of all the stimulus packages that have been put in place in order to save economies. 0.25%. But the greatest possible stimulus of them all is if we manage to fully fund ACT Accelerator and COVAX. Norway has contributed $500 million. For ethical reasons and because it is the smart thing to do. COVID-19 has also affected poverty-reducing tools like education, human rights and gender equality. Like other countries, Norway has had to make hard priorities. But we maintain development cooperation spending at 1% of GDP, with health and education as long-term priorities. The consequences of climate change are hitting the least developed countries the hardest. And that is why Norway has made climate adaptation, prevention and fighting hunger a priority in our international cooperation. We are actively engaged in the preparations of the UN Food System Summit in September. And always ready to collaborate with you on food systems for the summit and beyond. Access to sustainable and reliable energy services is crucial for eradicating poverty. And it is also good for our health and our climate. Norway is also co-leader of the Alliance for Digital Public Goods. If we can transform the digital divide into a digital bridge, there will be no limit to what those can do who are now deprived of opportunities to study, work, shop and create jobs. I would like to highlight digital ID as a vehicle for accessing social services. The Norwegian Global Digital Library is in use in countries like Ethiopia, Guinea, Gambia, Bangladesh, Rwanda, Mozambique and Uganda. We work closely with the World Bank Group, including IFC and the regional development banks to promote private sector development and job creation in low-income countries. Securing decent jobs for women and youth is more important than ever. Robust donor contributions to IDA and the African Development Fund are particularly important. We continue to support the African Development Bank's job for youth in Africa. And I look forward to cooperating with African leaders on how we can even further support local efforts for creating sustainable jobs. The Norwegian Development Finance Institution, Norfund, has invested 60% of its capital in sub-Saharan Africa, not least in equity and renewable energy. Norfund has taken concrete contra-cyclical actions in order to keep the wheels going for small businesses in Africa throughout the pandemic. And Norway has also supported different debt moratoria that have come in place as a result of the way the pandemic has added severity to already severe debt problems. However, payments of suspension only offer breathing spaces. We need to look at the different circumstances and different needs in each country. And I think we may have to go beyond um, mere payments, suspensions as well. The Paris Club is in the process of planning further steps in debt restructuring for countries in immediate debt distress. We do not expect sweeping debt forgiveness as under the HIPAC initiative. Rather, we expect the new plan to include a more targeted approach, focusing on countries in debt and unsustainable debt distress. In this regard, Norway will stress the need for new principles and guidelines on responsible borrowing and lending. We need strengthened global solidarity and cooperation in order to promote financial integrity, transparency and accountability for sustainable development. All we do in our development policy is aim toward one goal, increasing our partners' ability to create their own growth, to mobilize resources for sustainable development in this regard, 
upholding human rights and stopping illicit f flows from corruption and tax evasion can also be seen as poverty reducing tools and equally important as education and renewable energy. So let's grasp the opportunities, let's fight the pandemic and let's eradicate extreme poverty once and for all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that video. I will now give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Augustus Jonathan Tomo, General Minister for Economic Management in Liberia. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice President. Uh, your Excellencies, fellow colleagues, we would like to be thankful to the organizing committee for having spent a lot of time in the midst of COVID to still pull this Africa Regional Review meeting together and for which today we are all gathered today to have some conversations around very important issues of the program of actions which highlights issues of ownership and leadership of our development as these development countries, developed countries. The program of action, which talked about aligning our development agenda with the SDGs and at the same time, the Africa 6063, and ensuring that developing countries set themselves apart and position themselves for graduation into becoming developed countries has received a number of setbacks over the last couple of years, especially in the case of Liberia. It is no secret that Liberia has had a number of issues uh, including the Ebola crisis that we encountered in 2014. And coming out of war, we also experienced the fact that we had a peacekeeping force in Liberia that contributed to the cash flow and support of national uh, macroeconomic stability with resources that were coming in also went dry when the withdrawal of oil mill took place around 2017. To that end, we also have had a number of issues around commodity prices, a drop in commodity prices, which also created multiple programs, multiple issues in supporting our programs as a nation striving to meet its development goals in the midst of all the global challenges and macro financial issues. To that extent, the government and people of Liberia remain resilient, but still have been working very hard to ensure that national development agenda remains the focus of every player along the ladder from the presidency to ministers and other head of agencies in ensuring that we sustain and we have inclusive economic growth. The government of Liberia anchored its development agenda around four critical areas, power to the people, economy and jobs, sustaining peace with our history of coming from war and governance and transparency. Over the last period, we've worked very hard as a nation and people to focus on reforms that are consistent with domestic and international best practices, which will help us to be able to promote and enhance and strengthen our economic growth as a nation, and at the same time provide opportunity for our people to be transformed or to be out of poverty 
based on the application of, of our policies. Specific policy areas of reform that we've concentrated on over the last period have centered around four broad areas. One, restoring macroeconomic stability. Two, ensuring that there is a fiscally sustainable growth path. Three, addressing weaknesses in public sector governance and the rule of law. And four, ensuring that we provide basic social services across the state. In line of these, the government have remained very engaging with both the development partners and our private sector players to craft programs that will support sustainable economic engagements and results so that Liberia will still, in the midst of COVID and all the global challenges, will still continue to thrive and provide support to the nation and its people. Over the reform activities, we've done a number of activities that have focused on institutional reforms geared towards credible and sustainable growth and economic transformation. To the end, the government is looking and working very seriously towards issues around digitizing our economy as COVID has taught us enough lesson to digitize as quickly as possible and to diversify our economy at the same time promoting private sector growth, which will in turn lead to sustainable economic productivity and growth, especially looking at the real sector with emphasis on agriculture as our president his Excellency George Weir has emphasized. As we work in the space of our economic development, it is also important to note here that Liberia over the period has been classified as a donor-driven country, where most of our resources over the, within the period of the 10 years of the program of action, most resources supporting the national development have come from our development partners as well. So we'd like to recognize that our development partners have been very, very helpful and supportive to the people and government of Liberia. However, there have been substantial need for a stronger collaboration in ensuring that there's effectiveness in aid and also mobilizing and coordinating in a way that ensure that there's wider productivity in the deployment of aid resources. To that extent, even in the midst of COVID, in September of 2020, the government of Liberia and its partners, development partners, launched our most recent and comprehensive national aid and NGO policy, which highlights issues around country-led system as agreed by the Busan Agreement and Accra Agenda, alignment with national development priority, prioritizing the use of country system as a way of building capacity so that we are able to sustain the growth and development programs that we all are working towards, supporting and enhancing transparency and mutual accountability and of course, focusing on result-based management. With all of these, it remains glaring that COVID-19 has continued to challenge us all globally in ensuring that our development issues are addressed. However, our government, the, under the leadership of His Excellency Dr. George Weir, and our Minister of Finance, who drive and work along to drive the development program of the country, and the team of government officials, we've remained focused, and we're believing that, though we can confirm 
that is challenging to meet the agenda, the program of action. As agreed 10 years ago, we believe that we're resilient, with strategic targeting of resources and deployment, we'll focus on joint partnership and working to ensure that resources that are available to Liberia and its development partners and people are coordinatedly put together in a way that support the people. Honorable ladies and gentlemen, we would like to again emphasize that for us as a government, we see investment in agriculture, human capital development, digital transformation, road connectivity, electricity as key drivers of ensuring that our macroeconomic stability, which we've tried, which we fought to uphold over the last years, even though with all these crises, can be sustained if we ensure appropriate intervention. Once again, I would like to thank you all, organizers, for giving us the opportunity, and we look forward to a few days of engagement that will highlight a pathway to success in adjusting an actionable plan that will help develop, developing countries to meet the program of action as agreed 10 years ago. Thank you once again for organizing this moment. Thank you very much. That's good. Thank you. Um, they might close at when one noon. Thank you very much uh, to uh, the presentation from uh, Liberia. We, we have just uh, under one hour to go for our session. And I'd like to appeal that uh, we adhere to the four minutes because uh, for some reason, I'm not able to intervene when someone overshoots their time allocated. So if we could uh, be a lot more efficient with our delivery, uh, we, we will finish on time. So uh, we will now hear from Ms. Mami, Ms. Mutori, who is uh, the special representative for the UN Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Excellency. The Istanbul Program of Action has been instrumental in advancing the disaster risk reduction agenda in the LDCs. In light of the unprecedented increase in disaster risk over the past decade with climate emergency and now COVID-19 attacking us, the most at risk countries especially, there is an urgent need for the DRR agenda in the Istanbul Program of Action to reflect the multi-hazard and systemic nature of risk that LDCs face. The Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction adopted six years ago unanimously by all member states, including all the African member states, gave a clear direction and guidance for this. As nothing erodes sustainable development like disasters, disaster risk reduction must be placed at the core of the objectives, principles, and priorities of the program of action, particularly in the area of structural transformation, productive capacities, and infrastructure development. Enhancing prevention and disaster risk reduction in national strategies and policies is an important way forward to build resilience and ultimately towards graduation from the LDC category. The LDC-5 conference is a crucial opportunity to step up national action on disaster risk reduction, conducting risk assessment and integrating DRR into development sectors are the main challenges faced by LDCs. And in order to overcome these challenges, there is an acute need for increased international support. This support is necessary to finance the implementation of national disaster risk reduction strategies and support to capacity building for developing and also implementing risk-informed policies and legislation. Focusing on reducing risk and building resilience is critical to break the cycle of crisis and recovery. For this, we must shift our focus from responding to disasters after, after they strike us to preventing and preparing better to disasters 
before they come. I would like to commend the African member states, the African Union and sub-regional organizations on your very strong commitment to disaster risk reduction and would like to commit that the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction stands ready to support African LDCs in their journey towards resilience so that no country and nobody is left behind. Thank you very much, Excellency. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, very brief um, submission. We will now hear from Angola, and uh, this will be the State Secretary for Planning, Dr. Milton Reich. You have the floor. Okay, thank you. Excelencia, Senor Solus Claus Lima, Vice President of the Republic of Malawi, Excelencias, Ilustres Panelistas, Minhas senhoras e meus senhores, tenho a honra de, em representação do governo de Angola, dirigir mais este importante fórum que vai tratar da revisão do Plano de Ação de Istambul sobre os países menos avançados em África e desde já aproveito a oportunidade para agradecer. Como do vosso conhecimento, a pedido do nosso país, no dia 11 de fevereiro, a Assembleia Geral das Nações Unidas aprovou por unanimidade a, a resolução a barra 75, barra 57, sobre o período de extensão do período preparatório para a graduação da República de Angola a país de rendimento médio para três anos adicionais, isto é, até 2024. Devido à vulnerabilidade socioeconômica do país, agravada pela crise sanitária da pandemia da Covid-19 e as dificuldades econômicas atravessadas pelo nosso país para a diversificação da nossa economia. Entendemos que a graduação da lista de países menos avançados representa um importante marco na jornada de um país para o desenvolvimento sustentável, resiliente e autossuficiente e pretendemos que o nosso país avance com confiança para tornar a graduação bem-sucedida, irreversível e sustentável. Excelência, as minhas senhoras e meus senhores, a partir de 2016, a economia de Angola começou a ressentir os efeitos negativos decorrentes da baixa do preço do petróleo no mercado interno internacional, iniciada na segunda metade de 2014. A economia entrou em recessão e os principais agregados macroeconômicos entraram em desequilíbrio. Com vista a corrigir esses desequilíbrios, o resultado da queda do preço do petróleo, e que levou a economia a registrar crescimento negativo desde 2016, o governo de Angola, no âmbito das reformas econômicas em curso, assinou em 2018, com o Fundo Monetário Internacional, um acordo ao abrigo do Programa de Financiamento Ampliado no qual estabeleceu como objetivos primordiais a redução das vulnerabilidades orçamentais, o reforço da sustentabilidade da dívida, a redução da inflação, a implementação de um regime de câmbio flexível, o asseguramento da estabilidade do setor financeiro e o reforço do quadro de combate ao branqueamento de capitais e ao financiamento do terrorismo. Assinalamos com satisfação as três avaliações positivas do Programa com o Fundo Monetário Internacional, o que demonstra a confiança da comunidade financeira internacional no programa de reformas do governo angolano. Com vista a garantir um ambiente de negócio mais favorável para o aumento da produção nacional, também em 2018, o governo angolano aprovou o programa de apoio à produção, substituição de importações e diversão das importações, em que o principal ator é o setor privado, nacional e estrangeiro, e o Executivo desempenha o papel de facilitador na criação de condições para a realização de investimentos em setores prioritários como a agricultura, a agroindústria, as pescas, a indústria extrativa e transformadora, construção civil, turismo e outros, por serem setores que permitem não só gerar riqueza, mas também gerar empregos estáveis, indutores do bem-estar das famílias. Ainda neste processo de melhoria do ambiente de negócio, foi elaborado um cronograma de implementação das medidas de melhoria dos indicadores do Doing Business, definidas com o Banco Mundial, para melhorar a posição da Angola no ranking mundial. Também estabelecemos um quadro legal facilitador de criação e funcionamento das empresas privadas, que promova e defenda a livre iniciativa, a competitividade e a sã concorrência, com vista a salvaguardar a salutar defesa dos consumidores e para fazer face às situações de imperfeições do mercado ainda existente na nossa economia tendo sido aprovada a lei da concorrência e criado a autoridade reguladora da concorrência. Enfim, estamos a realizar reformas institucionais e econômicas profundas com vista a construir uma economia forte, sustentável e inclusiva, 
através da criação de um ambiente de negócios favorável ao investimento e à diversificação da economia. Excelências, minhas senhoras e meus senhores, o cenário macroeconômico nacional e internacional em 2020 foi marcado pela contração da atividade econômica em decorrência do impacto negativo da pandemia da Covid-19. Para mitigar o impacto da pandemia da Covid-19 nas vidas das famílias e empresas, Angola, tal como outros países, teve de dedicar uma boa parte das suas energias, recursos financeiros, humanos e científicos à luta contra a pandemia, para minimizar ao máximo as perdas de vidas humanas e adotar medidas de alívio econômico às empresas e famílias. Realçamos que Angola procurou amenizar os efeitos econômicos e financeiros da pandemia através de um conjunto de medidas de mitigação dos efeitos da pandemia da Covid-19 que passaram pela revisão do nosso orçamento geral do Estado de 2020 e implementação de um pacote de medidas de alívio econômico de impacto fiscal e monetário. Relativamente à questão sanitária, Logo após a OMS ter declarado o surgimento da SARS-CoV-2 como emergência de saúde pública global, o executivo angolano mobilizou-se rapidamente, tendo criado a Comissão Multissetorial para a Prevenção e Combate à Covid-19 e elaborado um plano de contingência com orientações precisas sobre a resposta à pandemia, a fim de se planificar de modo eficiente a mobilização de recursos humanos e materiais financeiros adequados. Angola priorizou os esforços financeiros para a melhoria da rede hospitalar do país, aumentou a capacidade de testagem dos cidadãos e continuou com o apoio de abastecimento de água potável e distribuição de cestas básicas às populações mais carenciadas. Ao mesmo tempo, foram construídos quatro centros de tratamento da Covid-19 e hospitais de campanhas em zonas consideradas sensíveis. Excelências, o governo da Angola tem realizado todos os esforços através de uma abordagem multissetorial e tem estado comprometido em conseguir atingir os objetivos de melhorar os índices de vulnerabilidade econômica e de capital humano através de uma boa governação, igualdade de direitos, respeito pela democracia e concessão de direitos, no sentido de cumprir com as orientações previstas no Programa de Ação de Istambul. Embora estejamos conscientes de que a Covid-19 seja uma ameaça, no domínio da vulnerabilidade econômica, todos os esforços foram realizados no sentido de não perdermos o foco naqueles que continuam a ser as principais prioridades do Executivo angolano, nomeadamente trabalhar para a reanimação e diversificação da economia, aumentar a produção nacional de bens e serviços básicos, aumentar o leque de produtos exportáveis e aumentar a oferta de postos de trabalho. No que diz respeito à inclusão social e à melhoria do índice de capital humano, o governo tem como prioridade melhorar o índice de desenvolvimento humano, que é uma das nossas principais metas no quinquênio 2018-2022. Essa aposta passa necessariamente pelo exercício da democracia participativa, pela inclusão econômica, social, cultural e digital, pelo combate à discriminação baseada no sexo, religião, grupo, grupos étnicos ou filiação partidária. Uh, minhas senhoras e meus senhores, distintos convidados, o principal desafio de implementação do Programa de Ação de Istambul continua a centrar-se na existência de recursos humanos e financeiros inadequados a todos os níveis, não só na implementação, mas também na monitorização e avaliação das ações e recomendações do programa. Entendemos que a redução da pobreza e a desigualdade, assim como a promoção do desenvolvimento humano, deve passar pela adoção de políticas relacionadas com a melhoria das condições macroeconômicas, do ambiente de negócio e do ambiente legal de modo a estimular o comércio, atrair, atrair investimento privado e alcançar a diversificação das exportações. Para aproveitar o dividendo demográfico, é importante que a África, com o apoio dos seus parceiros internacionais, aposte em estratégias para capacitação do capital humano e melhoria da qualidade do ensino para todos, com ênfase para a jovem mulher. O fortalecimento do sistema de saúde, com o objetivo de aumentar o acesso e melhorar a qualidade dos serviços de saúde o fortalecimento do Sistema Nacional de Proteção Social, com o objetivo de apoiar as famílias pobres com inclusão produtiva no seio das comunidades. Defendemos o papel preponderante da comunidade internacional e do Sistema das Nações Unidas no apoio aos países menos avançados, no alcance das recomendações das agendas adotadas a nível internacional, com destaque para o reforço do apoio internacional para a implementação eficaz e orientada da capacitação institucional nos países em desenvolvimento. Nesse sentido, apelamos aos parceiros de desenvolvimento dos países menos avançados para honrar os compromissos assumidos em relação às agendas adotadas a nível internacional 
e implementarem de forma coordenada e coerente as promessas de ajuda pública ao desenvolvimento através de um envolvimento mais determinado no setor econômico, social e ambiental. Muito obrigado pela vossa atenção. Right. Uh, thank you very much. We will now hear from uh, we will now hear from the ambassador uh, from Finland to to Malawi, uh, Ambassador Pijo Chodre. You have the floor. Thank you, Vice President of the Republic of Malawi, Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. It is an honor to represent Finland in this review meeting on the implementation of the Istanbul Program of Action. Having personally attended the meeting in Istanbul, I'm delighted to see the process moving forward, though I have to say I struggle to believe it was already 10 years ago. We commend Malawi for hosting this important meeting this week. Finland is a strong supporter of the multilateral system and the United Nations. International cooperation is particularly important now as the COVID-19 pandemic is taking its toll. Extreme poverty is increasing. The achievement of SDGs is under threat globally, but especially in the developing world and particularly in the LDCs. We are grappling with a health crisis as well as a social and economic one. My government, continues to contribute to international efforts to promote sustainable development and to combat climate change. We are part of the international COVID-19 response, bilaterally, multilaterally, and via the European Union. In promoting sustainable development, we also continue promoting innovation and entrepreneurship. Finland is particularly pleased to support preparations for the fifth LDC meeting in Doha. We are doing it by bringing together top level researchers in cooperation with the wider institute, which is part of the UNU system, UN University. The aim to produce an assessment of the constraints of that LDC space in achieving the SDGs, as well as producing uh, science based recommendations that will benefit the action plan for the remaining 10 years of Agenda 2030 implementation. We look forward to being part of continued international efforts to find solutions to the challenges that LDCs face. Certainly, like others here, we are committed to building back better and greener. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh statement. We will now uh, give the floor to Ms. Pamela Hamilton, Executive Director of the International Trade Center. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Vice President. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Please. Uh, yes, Honorable Vice see. President, Ministers, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. The Istanbul Program of Action, which we all adopted in 2011, was to our roadmap for the future we wanted. It encapsulated a vision where least developed countries would grow and prosper through trade, productive capacities, and partnership. Today, it is time to do a health check as we get closer to LDC 5 in January 2022. My assessment is that although some progress has been made, we have certainly raised the visibility of the systemic challenges affecting LDCs. We are not where we had hoped to be. I remain optimistic, however, despite the fact that collectively we're facing one of the greatest threats in a century and with another existential threat, that of climate change right around the corner. I don't need to speak with you of the destruction that the pandemic has wrought. It has been a health and an economic crisis that has exposed our vulnerabilities, but also energized us to move forward together to ensure that we're prepared to face the upcoming headwinds. The fact that in the depths of the pandemic, the African continental free trade area was formally launched shows the courage of your convictions. At a time when value chains were strained, 
when many of your economies were on lockdown and your health systems under incredible pressure, the message that African LDCs choose to project was one of closer collaboration and integration. As we move towards LDC 5 and we formulate a new roadmap adjusted to today's and tomorrow's challenges, we must take this inspiration from the AFCFTA and choose partnership for impact. The pandemic has stalled economic progress in the African LDCs and in Haiti. That is an undeniable fact. And the period of recovery will be slow. But even before COVID-19, we as a global community had fallen behind the curve in realizing the aspirations of the Istanbul Program of Action. We need to have an honest discussion amongst ourselves on why that has been the case. But more importantly, how do we adjust and cause course correct moving forward? We know the figures. The World Bank estimates that the pandemic is predicted to reduce growth by 3.3% in Sub-Saharan Africa. The outlook in Haiti also remains dire, where a decline by 3.1% in 2021 will be seen. The economic repercussions of the pandemic will disproportionately affect those most vulnerable in your economies, in particular, the micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, which are the mainstay of your economic, social, and employment ecosystem. ITC's 2020 survey of MSMEs in over 100 countries, including many LDCs, showed that one-fifth of MSMEs were at risk of being bankrupt and 15% of jobs may potentially be lost. I suspect if we were to do that same survey today, the results would be even more devastating. This is why ITC strongly suggests that the next program of action to support LDC growth and structural transformation in the post-COVID era must include MSMEs at its center. Policies and programs to build resilience and competitiveness coupled with aid for trade from traditional donors, South-South partners, and the private sector must be at the heart of a future program. A second element is addressing climate change. This has been the second pandemic that has never gone away. Going green cannot be a developed country construct. It must be an approach that LDCs mainstream into every economic and development policy. Thirdly, Third element must be digital empowerment, ensuring access to new technologies to allow MSMEs, women and youth entrepreneurs and rural farmers to be able to connect to the digital highway. The evidence shows that the businesses that stayed afloat during the pandemic were those that were about to connect to buyers, sellers and markets digitally. If there's one thing we have learned from the pandemic is that access to digital tools must be a priority moving forward. And a fourth element must be investing in women's economic empowerment. ITC research shows that women-owned enterprises have been particularly vulnerable during this period, as they are on average smaller in size and tend to have fewer assets and limited cash reserves to cushion the lockdown-induced liquidity shortages. ITC, through its She Trades initiative, will continue to work with your women entrepreneurs and partners, such as financial institutions, business support organizations, and development partners to further develop the competitiveness and capacity of women-led MSMEs to drive future growth. Africa remains the only region that can truly be the food basket of the world. It is becoming a leader in influencing the global creative industry. It remains the region with the youngest population, the greatest middle-class purchasing power growth, and with a spirit of innovation that is unrivaled. Haiti in the Caribbean, my region, with its culture, innovation, and drive also has incredible potential to be reaped if we support the country to truly become part of the Caribbean's regional value chain. But you cannot do this alone. The international community, your regional neighbors, the United Nations family, we all have an obligation to continue on this journey with you. And partnership will be key to leveraging our strengths. This is why I'm pleased that ITC and the OHRLLS are partnering to undertake joint evidence-based export potential analysis in selected LDCs to provide a data-driven roadmap on the sectors and products and services you could consider focusing on in your economic recovery. Excuse we have also, me, can you please come to the end? Yes, we are concluding now. We're committed to launching at LDC 5 
a practice route to recovery for LDCs. In Haiti, we're working closely with the UN community to contribute to practical trade development. Um, I wish to thank you for this opportunity um, and for the LDCs in Africa and the AFTS, AFCFTA, we promise significant gains. This is an opportunity to align ourselves and to do what needs to be done for the LDCs. We thank you again for this opportunity. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we shall now hear from His Excellency Dr. Namera Mamo, State Minister of Planning and Development Commission in Ethiopia. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chairman, Right Honorable Dr. Saulos Chilima, Vice President of the Republic of uh, Malawi. Let me start by thanking you and uh, your team for this excellent organization of uh, the meeting. Mr. Chairman, so commendable efforts have been made by all LEDCs over the last decade, including a significant progress across across the eight priority areas of the Istanbul Program of Action, we all agree that the overall level of the implementation has been mixed and the results had been uneven. We in Ethiopia have been consistently demonstrating strong political commitment and leadership to eradicate poverty through rapid and inclusive economic growth. Through our development planning, we have created the opportunities to mainstream and effectively implement global and regional development goals, including the Istanbul Plan of Action. Despite the rapid economic growth during the last decade, however, there are still structural issues which put challenges for the sustainability of our rapid economic growth. These challenges include slow structural transformation of the economy, a poorly functioning export sector, the government is taking several measures to improve the country's competitiveness in the global uh, market, which include trade facilitation, expanding port options, improving infrastructure, building industrial parks and uh, economic clusters, among so many other you know, development interventions. We are also promoting regional integration and cooperation as demonstrated, for example, by our decision to join the African continental free trade area and the resumption of the accession process to the membership of the World Trade Organization. Mr. Chairperson, coinciding with the LTC plan of action for the upcoming decade, Ethiopia has been taking a wide ranging measures, including home, homegrown economic reforms and also formulating a 10 year development plan, which ranges from 2021 to 2030 which really focuses on structural economic transformation and ensuring quality economic growth and shared prosperity, in addition to boosting the competitiveness of our, our economy to boost export growth. The SDGs and other global and regional development goals are fully and effectively mainstreamed in the 10-year development plan of Ethiopia. We will continue to investing on infrastructure development, including roads, energy, the ICT sector, to enhance the overall productivity and competitiveness of our domestic economy so that we will be able to compete in the regional and global value chains. Ethiopia will continue to promote regional integration and cooperation to unleash the market opportunities in the region through jointly constructing transportation infrastructure and exporting electricity to our neighboring countries. The government is also taking bold measures to improve ease of doing business so that Ethiopia will be ranked you know, among uh, the most attractive countries in the world in order to attract you know, foreign direct investment. A high level team, which is chaired by His Excellency Prime Minister Dr. Abiy Ahmed, is working on this issue in order to improve the, uh, uh, the ease of doing uh, business rank, which is while a new logistic strategy, which is part of the government's effort to promote the external trade sector and reduce transaction costs by engaging the private sector has already been you know, one of the main priority areas. Mr. Chairperson, the need for enhanced support to LDCs to overcome structural challenges. 
Are we winding up or we still have a long way to go? Just one minute, please. Challenges please. that they face in implementing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development cannot be overemphasized. The upcoming program of action of LDC5 is extremely critical in demonstrating the international community's commitment of leaving no one behind and reaching the farthest behind first. In this regard, the Africa Regional Review Meeting will set the tone for an ambitious, comprehensive, and action-oriented program of action for 2022 to 2032 with concrete deliver deliverables that address systemic economy-wide gaps and limitations that hinder efforts aimed at fostering productive capacities and structural economic transformation of the least developed countries. Finally, let me reaffirm Ethiopia's active and constructive engagement in the upcoming sessions of the Africa Regional Review Meeting and throughout the process leading to the successful conclusion of the LEDC5 in Doha, Qatar, with an ambitious, comprehensive, and action-oriented outcome document that supports these developed countries in their endeavor of implementing the Agenda 2030 in the remaining decade. I thank you all for your attention, and God bless you all. Thank you very much, sir. We will now hear from the Deputy Director for Africa, the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, Germany. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair, Excellencies, Honorable Ministers from African LDC, and uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this Africa Region Review poses an important opportunity for to assess the structural challenges and emerging issues faced by African LDCs and Haiti. And the outcomes of this week's discussions will provide guidance on the way towards LDC 5 and for implementing the Istanbul Program of Action, the uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development as well as for the AU's own agenda 60, uh, 2063. Along this way, Germany will continue its longstanding cooperation with LDCs with urgency to work towards ending the COVID-19 crisis and towards a fast recovery. Germany is keenly aware of the pressing need and additional challenges LDCs face due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic in response and beyond to uh, the German contribution via the EU's programs. We have launched an emergency COVID-19 support program in which Germany committed 5.3 billion euros from the 2020 and 21 development budget to help expand health infrastructure in developing countries, secure jobs, ensure food security, and stabilize crisis region as well as assist in refugee camps. It is our conviction that uh, we either beat the coronavirus everywhere and together or that we will not beat it at all. Germany has repeatedly stressed the need to promote equitable access to vaccines and support the global ACT accelerator. Uh, in 2020, Germany was the second biggest funder with 600 billion euro, million euros. Furthermore, Chancellor Merkel has just pledged um, an increase in German support to the Global Act Accelerator by an additional 1.5 billion euros. And uh, Germany will continue its financial and political efforts to support a multilateral solution to this crisis. The COVAX facility has met a significant milestone by securing access to 2 billion doses of vaccines. However, we remain concerned at the slow progress of closing the remaining financing gaps. And we encourage development partners as much as uh, multilateral development banks to increase funding to the ACT Accelerator in 2021. The world cannot move at two speeds in defeating the pandemic. That would not just be unjust, but it would also be advised, unwise because uh, harmful mutations of the virus will not be stopped and have not been stopped at borders. The COVID-19 crisis must also serve as an opportunity to build resilience against future crises and shocks, as well as to accelerate the global transformation to its foundations to resilient, inclusive and environmentally sustainable economies. We support developing countries' efforts to overcome the macroeconomic shock, fiscal and external imbalances caused by COVID-19, restore fiscal space and sustainability in the medium and long term, and enhance environmentally sust sustainability to recover better in line with the national sustainable development strategies and the sustainable development goals. We explicitly welcome a discussion on how to align recovery measures with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, 
and we pay significant attention to the goal of recover forward using the 2030 agenda as a compass. Build back better and greener should be a leading slogan in our policies and in our cooperation, focusing on green, resilient and inclusive growth that generates jobs alongside healthcare and social spending. As this conference moves ahead, we're looking forward to learn more about the efforts and measures uh, that have been taken by LDCs to combat. About one, about one minute. I'm wrapping up, thank you. As much as the specific obstacles that need to be overcome. Honorable Chair, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. And I close with uh, wishing us all very productive and fruitful discussions in the next days. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, we will now give the floor uh, to the UN Technology Bank for the LDCs, Mr. Joshua Setipa. You will have the floor. Vice President. The Right Honourable, the Vice President of uh, the Republic of Malawi, Honourable Ministers, Heads of International Organizations, Distinguished Delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Let me join uh, previous speakers in expressing our appreciation to the government and the people of Malawi for hosting this important meeting. This meeting comes at a crucial time for the least developed countries as they continue to not only respond to the current pandemic, but to also take stock of progress in the implementation of the Istanbul Plan of Action. The Technology Bank was born out of the Istanbul Program of Action and is the first SDG indicator to be achieved in the 2030 Agenda. Chair, COVID-19 has changed the world in more than one way, resulting in a significant impact on health, social, economic, and political structures in the LDCs. From the total disruption of global supply chains to the working environment, there is no doubt that COVID-19 will significantly set back global efforts to eradicate extreme poverty and previous gains in critical areas such as health. The reality now is that the LDCs, which we're already lagging, will now be further left behind. Chair, if there's one key lesson we've learned over the past 12 months, it is that partnerships are the only way we can address the challenges faced in the LDCs. We have all witnessed how through global partnerships in science, COVID-19 vaccines were developed in record time for a disease that was unknown 12 months ago. It is only through strong partnerships and enhanced coordination that LDCs can successfully respond to COVID-19 and recover, foster productive capacities, graduate from LDC status, and achieve the sustainable development goals. However, a post-COVID-19 recovery that will lead to a more sustainable, resilient, and inclusive future will require a coordinated multilateral response and the use of innovative tools and risk mitigation instruments. These efforts must address the following in our view. First, they must tackle inequality within and across countries. The nationalism demonstrated initially in the procurement of PPE and related COVID-19 technologies, and now in relation to vaccines is one of many examples. They must also bridge the digital divide. They must also strengthen healthcare systems. They should also enhance STI capacities in LDCs and develop supportive networks by facilitating collaboration and resource sharing between public and private sectors, actors in the LDCs and globally on STI development in the LDCs. In conclusion, Chair, the Technology Bank stands ready to support LDCs to identify the STI challenges and opportunities as a means to building productive capacities and promoting structural economic transformation and achievement of SDGs. I thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for that uh, very brief presentation. We, we are now going to hear from uh, His Excellency Mr. Ronaldo Costa, permanent representative to the UN in uh, New York. You have the floor. Ambassador Costa. Well, I guess they're not on, so we'll proceed with the uh, WIPO, Mr. Hassan Clay, Deputy Director General, Regional and National Development Sector. You have the floor. Sorry, we can't hear you. No. 
Mugan. Are you on mute? Can you hear me? Sorry, we cannot hear you. Maybe we can continue with Denmark and get back. Yeah, I thought that was Rico. Um, if that is the case, we we can proceed with uh, Uganda. If there's a technical issue, we can proceed with Uganda, and then we can come back. So maybe let's proceed with uh, Ambassador Philip Odida, Deborah Permanent Representative to the UN. Thank you. the floor. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Right. Excellency Vice President of the Republic of Malawi, Minister of Economic Planning and Development and Public Sector Reforms, all other protocols observed. It gives me an honor to give this statement on behalf of the Uganda government. I wish to congratulate the government of the Republic of Malawi and the United <laughs> Nations for organizing this regional meeting of African LDCs and Haiti to review the implementation of the Istanbul Program of Action for LDCs for the fifth UN conference. I pay tribute to the President of UN General Assembly, Secretary General, Under Secretary General and High Representative of UN OHRLS and the entire Secretariat of LDC5 Conference Prep Prom, as well as developing partners for their dedication and commitment to the work of LDCs. I commend the Republic of Turkey for actively spearheading the follow-up of the implementation of the current program of action and the state of Qatar for its generous offer to host the fifth UN conference. Chair, I start by acknowledging that while the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic is truly global in scale, its multifaceted impacts have had much more serious ramifications for the LDCs. And therefore it's critical that the fifth conference on LDC should adopt a new program of action that is ambitious and action oriented to support graduation and smooth transition of LDCs as we build back better for the COVID-19 pandemic. Chair, Uganda like other LDCs has continued to face numerous challenges during the implementation period of IPOA. These include limited productive capacities, limited funding, insufficient physical infrastructure, commodity price volatility, climate change, biodiversity loss and disasters. Notwithstanding the structural constraints to development faced, I wish to report that Uganda had registered some progress in the last eight years in implementing the pro program of action. In particular, nominal GDP more than doubled from 50, an average of 50 trillion Uganda shillings in 2010 to about 100 trillion in 2017-2018. National paved road net work increased, accessibility to electricity and innovations, as well as the use of mobile technology for financial transactions increased. In addition, primary school enrollment increased, uh, mat while maternal infant mortality rates and HIV rates reduced. To ensure that Uganda remains on track of its national and international commitments, Uganda adopted its third national development plan from the period 2021 to 2025 under the theme, Sustainable Industrialization for Inclusive Growth, Employment and Wealth Creation. The plan prioritized policy actions for implementation to increase household incomes and improve the quality of life of Uganda through sustainable industrialization, enhanced value addition and increased investment in productive infrastructure. Our key lessons learned so far have been the following. First, the need to strengthen public investment management to efficiently and effectively implement national development plans. Secondly, there's a need to build productive capacities to address particularly supply uh, value chain constraints through value addition and export diversification. Third, 
we realize we need to holistically invest in human capital development and effectively manage the population through priority interventions that aim at determining human resource requirements for the economy and re-engineering the formal and informal education systems to respond thus. We also need to intensify efforts to address climate change, biodiversity loss and disasters through implementation of climate change adaptation and mitigation and biodiversity conservation and disaster risk reduction actions respectively. Fifth and final, to identify and exploit alternative resources, sources of revenue to enhance domestic revenue mobilization and explore other forms of financing such as blended finance. Chair, the evidence from the IPOA implementation overall assessment indicates insufficient progress towards achievement of our overarching goals of well, half of the well, LDCs well, graduating by 2020. Well, we therefore well, during this fifth conference agree should agree on a program of action that calls for more enhanced, renewed and strengthened global partnerships to support graduation and smooth transition of LDCs as agreed upon in major UN conferences and summits. In our view, this program should contain robust means of implementation to support the LDCs in adequately addressing existing structural constraints. In con as I conclude, I indicate that um, with regard to these con constraints in particular, the program should contain robust follow-up and monitoring framework at all levels to track its timely implementation. In conclusion, I reiterate Uganda's commitment as a bureau member of the LDC5 PrepCom uh, to champion the special needs of LDCs during the preparation of the new program to support graduation and smooth transition of remaining LDCs. We look forward to international community, in particular our development partners to continue extending the necessary support and cooperation in this regard. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for that. I will move on to give the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Trin Rask, State Secretary of Development Corporation in Denmark. You have the floor. Denmark. Yes, please, you have the floor, go ahead. Can you hear us, Denmark, please? Start. Can we switch? Can we switch? Right, so while we wait for that, I'm going to go and ask Brazil to come and present. Brazil, can you hear thank, us? Thank, thank you very much, Your Excellency, Mr. Saulos Chilima, Vice President of Malawi, distinguished ministers, heads of delegation, excellencies. Allow me to express my satisfaction at joining the Africa Regional Review Meeting. This event is an important part of the preparations for the fifth UN conference on the least developed countries. As a member of the group of friends of LDCs, Brazil attaches great importance to our relationship with LDC partners. For the past decade, Brazil has contributed to the development of LDCs through the provision of South-South cooperation with an aim to foster sustainable development through human and institutional capacity building. Cooperation projects have flourished in a wide array of areas, including agriculture, education, health, strengthening of local markets, and technical cooperation, especially with partners such as Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Haiti, Mozambique, and Saint Tomé and Principe. We have also celebrated fruitful projects in the cotton industry with Benin, Burkina Faso, Chad, and Mali. Such initiatives have always been implemented as a response to the development priorities of our LDC partners. The relevance and importance of South-South cooperation cannot be overstated. Despite our common efforts in the past decade, 
we note that many targets of the Istanbul Program of Action have not been achieved. This puts LDCs in a challenging situation to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, especially in the current context of global recession, health emergency, and growing food insecurity. The fifth UN Conference on LDC comes, therefore, at a timely moment. A new program of action will be needed for the 1 billion people that currently live in LDCs, that is 14% of the world population. Thematic priorities for this document should include one, science, technology, and innovation, two, two. agriculture, and three, international trade. As for the first of these issues, innovation will only thrive if LDCs have proper technological capabilities. In particular, access to digital technologies will be a key in enabling LDC firms to participate in the global digital economy. This should go hand in hand with business and managerial capabilities, data management, and dynamic marketing capabilities. As regards agriculture, this sector accounts for more than 20% of GDP in LDCs. The importance of agriculture for employment is especially strong in African LDCs and Haiti, where agriculture generates as much as 62% of jobs. Because of the centrality of agriculture in LDCs, agricultural transformation with enhanced productivity and efficiency can be the quickest path to population and inclusive development. This becomes even more important in the current scenario of growing world population and increasing food insecurity and malnutrition. Now, LDCs, thank you. Now, LDCs have not improved their participation in world trade during the Istanbul Program of Action due to unfavorable commodity market conditions, according to the latest UNCAD report. Efforts to diversify trade and strengthen infrastructure could be a key in boosting this area. In addition, we must ensure that supply chains keep functioning. Unfortunately, we have witnessed since the onset of the pandemic, trade restrictive measures apply to agricultural products, emergency medical equipment, and now vaccines. Finally, the new program of action uh, could also set graduation strategies that ensure a smooth transition for LDCs as noted by uh, the State Secretary from Angola. How a country graduates is as important as when it graduates. Support for LDC's progress towards graduation will be key in order to overcome the unfortunate fact that so far only six countries have graduated. Allow me to conclude my remarks by reaffirming the importance that my government attaches to the fifth UN conference on LDCs and its preparatory process. I am confident that this regional review will provide valuable inputs for the next meetings of the Preparative Committee in New York on our way to a new program of action for LDCs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We shall have Denmark and then thereafter WIPO. So Denmark and WIPO, Denmark will go first. Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues. I'm sorry for the technical problems here on my side. I'm very pleased to be able to attend uh, today's important meeting, important meeting on the discussions on the implementation of the Istanbul Programme of Action in the African region. As we have witnessed throughout today's interventions, there is no doubt that the LDCs, many of the countries represented here today, are among the hardest hit uh, by the many facets of the uh, pandemic. Apart from immediate health risks, COVID-19 is causing rising numbers of unemployment, stagnant trade and investment flows. It's increasing poverty and food insecurity uh, and food insecurity. On top of this, many of the LDCs are also being hard hit uh, by the climate, uh, by conflict and climate changes that we see today. But let me be very clear, these are not your challenges. They are the challenges, challenges of, for all of us. As, lo as a long-standing and committed partner, Denmark is taking our share of joint responsibility very seriously. For more than 40 years, we have been delivering more than 0.7% of GNI in development aid. We may be a small country, but we are very committed to building a more fair, equal and green world. In 2020, we reprioritized 1 billion Danish kroner to the COVID-19 crisis in support of acute health 
uh, crisis uh, uh, and also focused on uh, the, the other consequences in terms of health, sexual reproductive health and rights, education, human rights, and so on. Furthermore, Denmark supported international cooperation to ensure fair and equal access to safe and effective vaccines. Through the EU, we have been supporting the COVAX facility, where we have, from the EU side, contributed 500 million euros in grants, loans, and guarantees. Denmark, from a bilateral uh, side, have also uh, contributed to the COVAX as a direct uh, donor with 50 million Danish kroners. And we have been supporting UNICEF supplies for efficient and safe distribution. We have also been chipping in to the World Bank Initiative on Electrification of Health Clinics uh, in Africa with Renewable Energy. More than ever, we need to work together to ensure that we build back a better, greener and more equal world from the pandemic for everyone, not the least those furthest left behind. This is why Denmark has taken the global lead on SDG 7 and will continue to work for sustainable energy for all. Green investments are not only good for our climate, they are also creating jobs, providing better lives and stronger societies. This is the future we believe in. On a final note, I would like to highlight that Denmark is in the process of preparing a new development cooperation strategy. Africa is and will remain our key uh, geographical focus with an even stronger emphasis. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you um, for that brief statement. We will now have people uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll guide how we proceed. We you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Honorable Vice President. Can you hear me? Yes, please, you, you proceed. Okay, Excellency, distinguished delegate, uh, indeed it is an honor for me to speak in this regional review meeting on behalf of the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. WIPO is committed to promoting innovation and creativity in all countries, including ensuring that special needs of LDCs are fully addressed and to empowering them to utilize intellectual property as a tool for wealth creation, social and cultural development. Hence, WIPO continues to assist LDCs in integrating IP into their respective national development policies and strategies. With adoption of WIPO deliverables for LDC for 2011-2020 during the fourth UN conference on LDC, WIPO has been actively contributing to the implementations of the Istanbul Program of Action to programs and activities that are focused on building technological capacity and transfer of appropriate technology for the promotion of innovation and creativity. Allow me now to highlight some of main programs and activities under the WIPO deliverables for LDC that we have achieved as of today. First, since 2010, 25 African LDCs have adopted and are implementing their national IP policies and strategies. Second, during the period of 2010, 2020, 511 participants from African LDCs have benefited from training program on intellectual property rights for economic growth and development for LDCs organized by WIPO with development assistance of the Swedish government. Third, in the same period, 194 students from African LDCs have participated in the WIPO joint master degree program on IP for LDCs. Fourth, in the area of branding and trademark, WIPO has organized a range of capacity building activities for 26 LDCs in Africa. Meanwhile, legislative assistance and policy advice on traditional knowledge and cultural expression has also been provided upon request. And last but not least, WIPO appropriate technology program for LDCs as a need-based development cooperation project have been benefited some LDCs in Africa in addressing specific development related issues. Excellencies, distinguished delegate, despite some sign of progress, there is a need to continue to support the effective use of IP for growth and development in LDCs. The COVID-19 pandemic poses multiple challenges to all countries, including the LDCs. Science, innovation, and technology can offer effective and sustainable solutions. IP can be a strategic tool to promote innovation and give a boost to SMEs, generate income and create jobs. LDC have the, have the potential to reap economic benefits from using aspect of IP system to enhance competitiveness. Therefore, capacity and institution building for science, technology, innovation, and the use of IP in LDCs should, in our view, be among the key substantive areas of focus at the fifth UN conference on LDCs. 
Under the leadership of our, of our Director General, Mr. Darren Tang, the organization remains strongly committed to strengthen its support for LDC's member state while focusing on sustainable impact. WIPO will continue to be responsive and proactive to assist the LDCs in their efforts to attain national economic growth and development goals. We will intensify our effort support to promote innovation and creativity to enhance the productive capacity and competitiveness of the LDCs in the rapidly evolving global knowledge-based economy. We aim to provide more needs-based and impact-oriented activities and projects to facilitate the LDCs using IP as a tool for growth and development. In the run-up to the PIP UN conference on LDCs, together with our beneficiary countries, we will review the progress. I hope you be winding up. I hope yeah. you be winding up. We'll do, we'll do, in a minute. Why, uh, we, we are going to implementation, the, uh, review the WIPO deliverables for LDCs, and we are looking forward to developing a new set of WIPO deliverables to bring more benefit and impacts for the beneficiary LDCs. Let me conclude, Excellencies, by wishing you all a productive deliberation and very successful outcome of this regional review meeting. I thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much uh, from WIPO. We started 10 minutes late, uh, and uh, from that time allocation, we have three minutes. Uh, I would like to seek an indulgence that uh, perhaps push it by uh, another eight minutes so that we can listen to the two statements, one from Mr. Demba Demele, president of LGC Watch, and then thereafter, Mr. Nixon Casolene, who is a youth representative. So we shall go with Mr. Uh, Demele first. Uh, I hope you make it in four minutes, and then thereafter, we close with uh, the youth representative. Mr. Demele, you have a Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please proceed. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Honorable uh, Dr. Chilima, Excellencies, distinguished guests, guests and colleagues, on behalf of LDC Watch, I express my sincere gratitude to the government of Malawi and the UN for inviting our network to take part in this regional meeting. This illustrates the trust built between the UN system and LDC Watch since its launch in 2001 in Brussels with the presence of the late Kofi Annan. Since then, it has articulated the views of LDC's civil society organizations at all major UN meetings. That was the case in 2011 in Istanbul where LDC Watch mobilized more than 300 civil society representatives and held a successful forum in the presence of Mr. Ban Ki-moon, the then UN Secretary General. One of the key objectives of the Istanbul Program of Action was to enable half the, member, half of the, half the number of LDCs to meet the criteria for graduation by 2020. Obviously, this goal has not been achieved. Only three LDCs did graduate since 2011, with just one from Africa, Equatorial Guinea, in 2017, in addition to Samoa and Moniatu. This raises questions about the graduation process. The fixation on graduation surely misses the real issues that mediate to be addressed. LDCs still face tremendous challenges and vulnerabilities, which persist despite the commitments made in successive programs of action and because of the failure to meaningfully full, address the structural barriers that prevent real progress. In making graduation the primary goal, the criteria used to assess a country's performance will tend to be designed to make it happen irrespective of the reality. We have serious concerns about the criteria and the quality of the data used. Taking GDP based on market process is a false reflection of the reality of most LDCs. The indicators for measuring economic and social progress have to be removed to enable them 
to capture meaningful improvement in LDCs and non-LDCs alike. The triennial, triennial review of the Committee for Development Policy takes place this week to consider proposals on the graduation of countries from the LDC category. The absence of 2020 data and hence COVID-19 impact on the three key criteria that determine graduation may result in a total fraud review leading to premature graduation assessment of LDCs. Of LDCs. Even UNCTAD in its 22 LDC report warned that, I quote, the world economic crisis brought by the COVID-19 pandemic may affect the previously planned graduation of LDCs, unquote. The second key issue related to the failure of past programs of action is the nature of international cooperation. Most of the commitments made to LDCs have never been entirely fulfilled. For instance, commitments on financial flows, trade and technical assistance made in 20, in 2001 in Brussels, in reaffirmed in 2011 in Istanbul, remain unfulfilled. LDCs are still characterized by low income, inadequate investment in education and health, as well as economic vulnerability. Most still depend on primary products and agricultural production, making them vulnerable to commodity prices, fluctuations, and other external shocks. Other challenges include digital inequalities, vulnerability to climate change, and the impact of intellectual property, property rights, which tend to obstruct LDC's path to sustainable development. The structural transformation and the diversification of LDC's economies is urgently needed. While there has been a general consensus that Africa has been spared the huge losses from the COVID-19 pandemic, predicted by the UN and other international bodies, there are not yet definitive conclusions. Even with the limited number of infections reported in several countries, African LDCs healthcare system have been overwhelmed due to the structural deficiencies already mentioned, the ability of the health systems to respond to respond is severely restricted because of the lack of adequate health centers and equipment. Urgent action is needed to counter the threat from the virus and its consequences. We call on the United Nations and all developed partners to facilitate African countries' access to vaccine on a timely basis. This is of utmost urgency for LDC. The lack of access to vaccine in LDC is not only immoral, it also poses a threat to the rest of the world. Of the world. We urge all governments to support the proposal currently on the table at the WTO to waive certain trips obligations for the prevention, treatment, and the containment of COVID-19. The proposal presented was presented in October 2020 and had, has gained the support of many countries and civil society organizations, including LDC Watch. Moreover, we strongly support the LDC group's request for an extension of the WTO trips LDC general transition period for as long as the country remains remains an LDC as for an additional 12 year period after its graduation from the LDC status in order to ensure a smooth you transition. This request is fully, is, is fully justified. You have a minute to wind up, sir. Two minutes, he said, sir. Two minutes. One. We therefore urge WTO members to honor their obligations under Article 66.1 and unconditionally grant LDC's request extension. Indeed, African countries have been hard hit by the global economic recession uh, brought about by the pandemic. The African Union, the African Union has estimated that up to 49 million more Africans may fall into extreme poverty. To limit the socio-economic consequences of the pandemic trade the vast African, African LDCs, decisive action needs to be taken for the mobilization of financial resources in other areas. One of them is debt cancellation called for by African countries 
with the broad international support, including Pope Francois. The moratorium granted by G20 countries is not the right answer. The unsustainable debt problem burden is crippling LDC's efforts to finance their development. Therefore, bilateral and multilateral development partners should not only cancel the debt, but also provide the predictable and accessible financing, financial resources to African LDCs. In this regard, we, are, we urge development partners to fulfill their pledge made to allocate 0.2% of their GNP to LDCs. On trade issues, we urge to realize the timely implementation of duty-free, quota-free market access on a lasting basis, address non-tariff measures and eliminate arbitrary and unjustifiable non-tariff barriers, ensure that potential rule, preferential rules of origin Thank you very much. Thank you very much. In conclusion, in conclusion, LDC Watch recommend, recommend the following. Reassess the graduation process by re-examining the preparatory period, reviewing the criteria and the data used. Make a serious evaluation of the record of the international cooperation when it comes to LDCs. Provide more policy space to LDCs in international decision making and strengthen their ownership and leadership on development issues. Provide more policy space to LDC Watch and other CSO in order to enhance their participation in debate on development issues at national, regional, international level. In from my closing, LDC Watch hope that this meeting will take bold and decisive actions to tackle the multiple challenges faced by African Thank you very much. Um, shall we now proceed to hear from Mr. Nixon Kasoleni, who is the Central Committee member for Tejo. You have the floor. And five minutes, Max. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now hear you, sir. Please proceed. Your Excellency, Vice President of Malawi, Excellencies, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank the government of Malawi and all partners of, of, for, organize, for organizing uh, this meeting and for inviting the social so, uh, the civil society to share our perspective. The main goal of the Istanbul program of action was to enable half of the least uh, develop the country to meet the criteria of graduation by 2020. This was not achieved. Only three African countries have graduated. Three others scheduled to graduate in 2024. And more are getting closer and closer to that ambition goal. But we don't deny it. Great progress has been made in some priority areas despite the presence of COVID uh, pandemic, which has posed a great challenge for the future graduation prospect of least developed country. So briefly, you will agree with me that in all LDCs in Africa, there is a need to solve this health issue, security issues, to improve access to education, productive employment, and decent work, which are central plans of the SDGs. There are many gaps to fill in infrastructure, transport, access to energy, and information and communication technology, ICTs, which continue to hold back the development of productive and trade capacity in LDCs in Africa. The civil society suggests the matters requiring attention. For LDCs in Africa, tackling an economic, social, and environment challenge, LDCs must apply all lessons learned from the implementation of the 
IPOA and national experience of success, successful implementation of MDGs, including give, giving more importance to the, to the integration of global development agendas into national and subnational strategies and, and uh, budget. Uh, identify all obstacle because if obstacle are identified and then uh, systematically addressed with the precision, growth can be uh, progress can be in intensified very quickly. To development partners, it is important that they support the hard work of capacity building and help in the development of goal policies and action programs and also support in the execution. Uh, knowing that the majority of the population in many Africa LDCs is made up of youth, uh, of young people, so to achieve the sustainable development objective, it will be necessary to further build and realize what the Istanbul program of action already recognized that young people are necessary resource that needs to be maximized and constitute, uh, co constitute an opportunity for our progress. The ongoing negotiation process for the new program of action will benefit from the vast experience of young people as agents of change. This is possible if and only if they participate fully. For involving young people in policy processes and decision making, it is important that young people are recognized as equal partners and relevant stakeholders. In addition, to involve young people in the process, it will be necessary to first create space to engage young, to engage young people, giving them a place at the table. Secondly, not only to create and offer this space in passive way, but to empower young people with the mean to actually use it. For example, with capacity building, awareness raising, institutional support, financial support, etc. To finish, we must all remember that it is, a, it is young people's right to be included in processes that will affect one way or another their present life and their future. As we say, nothing about us without us. Excellencies, I hope you will find some of these ideas useful for the discussion in this African Regional Review meeting. Thank you for your attention. I would like to thank you, Dixon, my newly found friend. And um, on that note, first to apologize that uh, we have taken uh, 15 minutes more than we should have taken because we started first 10 minutes late, but we overshoot. I would like to thank you all for your very important statements. I am sure that uh, we are all looking forward to a very engaging week with the very important sessions. I can only encourage everyone to attend as many sessions as possible. Uh, one lesson for sure over the last 10 years, uh, which we have seen today, is that uh, you cannot share lessons learned in 10 years in four minutes. I, I would like to wish you all the best for the rest of the week and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. And for those that is afternoon, good afternoon. And for those of us that is evening, good evening. And uh, all the very best for the week. Thank you. <laughs>